everyone. I'm going to call to order the regular meeting of the Committee on Ordinance. Um, it's Tuesday, August 31st at 6.30 um, p.m. I'm Rebecca Lisi, City Councilor at Large, the Chair. Um, to my left, we have our Acting Mayor, Terry Murphy. Um, to my right, we have uh, Councilor for Ward 5, Linda Vacan. Um, and then joining us online, we also have uh, City Councilor from Ward 4, Councilor Hernandez. Um, and in the chambers, we have uh, City Councilor at Large, Michael Sullivan. Uh, the Planning Board is joining us this evening for a number of special hearings that will be taking up, sorry, public hearings that will be taking up uh, jointly. Um, since they're not here and it seems that they are about 10 minutes behind schedule, I would uh, entertain a motion to proceed out of order to the items that do not require uh, the joint hearing. So moved. Second. Motion made and seconded. I think that first item would be... Um, <clears throat> would it be five? Because um, we already have the recommendation. Sure. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, because they voted. I think they already, voted, already closed so the public yep. hearing. Yep. Yes, thank you. So um, the motion has been made uh, to take up item number five out of order. All in favor? All right. Aye. So moved. I'm looking for a. Uh, here it is. Um, so item number five is a zone change application from RO to DR for Gordon Alexander at 472, 474, 476 Appleton Street. Uh, and the corresponding parcels are listed on the order. Um, the request is to make the zone change to expand allowed use for pers two personal services as allowed in the adjacent DR zone. Um, we heard this public hearing and closed it on the 27th of July and we've received a recommendation from the planning board. I'll read it into the record. Um, so please be advised that it, at its July 27th, 2021 meeting, the Holyoke Planning Board discussed the above reference zone change requests. And after consideration of all the information and testimony presented during the public hearing, the board unanimously voted to recommend to the ordinance committee of the city council that the zoning map change as requested be approved. The board noted that the proposed DR zone is consistent with the surrounding zoning and residential neighborhood. This change will contribute to neighborhood improvements by allowing certain currently excluded service businesses to conveniently locate um, near residents. So, and this is from John Kelly, the chair. I'm going to make a motion that the zone change be approved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded that the zone change be approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. I see that we're now joined also by um, Councilor Anderson Burgos, who's a member of this committee. I'm going to register that vote as a five to zero vote, unless I um, hear otherwise. No, you're good to go. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. Not at all. There's a fine. <laughs> um, okay. Proceeding out of order to number six. This is a order filed by Councilor Lebron Martinez. Um, did you actually call and have somebody come in on this, or? Uh, I did let them know it was going to be ta taken up this evening. Um, I did not get a response as far as if somebody was going to be joining us. Okay, thank you. So maybe we should go out of order. Okay, I'd make a motion to go out of order to item seven, just Second. in case. Second. Yes, thank you. Um, the motion has been made and seconded to take up item number seven, that the no parking sign in front of 982 Hamden Street be removed. Um, under discussion, I believe that we have language from the engineer. Uh, yes, he did provide measurements. And that was sent to legal who they would give it to the <laughs> Um, we do have measurements and it's in front of legal, so we could have the uh, legal language uh, sent over to us for the next meeting. Is there a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion mm -hmm. that the uh, no parking at, in front of 982 Hamden Street be uh, removed from the ordinance and the sign be removed. Second. Motion, been, motion is made and seconded to um, adopt item number seven and that we um, make the change in the ordinance and the sign be removed. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. 
Motion to take up item eight. Motion made and seconded. This is an item uh, filed by Councilor Murphy that no parking be allowed on Bullier Street from the northeast section with Stebbin Street to a point 40 feet north northerly. Um, under discussion, Councilor Murphy. Yeah, I, I've worked with the Hazen paper as well as with the city engineer to, uh, this is basically trying to make sure that their truck deliveries on, Bowie, on their uh, factory on Bowyer Street can get there relatively easily. And without this, if this, there's parking there that a uh, true freight truck cannot get in there without taking significant amount of time and a lot of maneuvering. So with this, uh, they're in a position they can just back in, get in and get out. So it, it makes it much more efficient for both the truck driver as well as the company. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Bacon. Thank you. Is that the street where the driveway that the tractor trailer has to bark back into is essentially on the street? Yes. Okay. Yes. I and remember that when the new business went in there, they were concerned about it at the time. Yeah, and this would basically allow the truck to come in and basically go straight back. Do what they need to do. Whereas right. the other way, they had to go out here and then they had to come in around and then try to, right. almost like an S to get in there. Right, I had sort of hoped they worked that out because it sounded like in the early days they might. Uh, well, we did change the parking on the other side, but then people started parking where this is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then that created, because this originally was, there was no way to park in there because they were all parking on the other side. But when we removed the other one, they started parking here and it caused another problem. So I think this pretty <laughs> much effect. makes it so they can get in and out. Okay. We'll see. I mean, I, there's no, I, we can't take the whole street. So that's two parking well, spots. Well, no, but they've got to be able to. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it does. I mean, I've seen it. I've been there when, mm -hmm. when it, that spot was open. And it's like five minutes. And I've been there when that spot is not open. Oh. And it's 15 minutes. At least, right? Okay. Um, um, you want to make I'll make a motion to adopt. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second. Motion is second. seconded to adopt um, item number eight. All in favor? Aye. 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 So Aye. Um, five zero is what I'm recording. Um, item number nine, filed by Councilor Bartley and Hernandez, that the no parking sign proximate to 282 Cabot Street be, re be moved north and relocated as close to the street corner near Locust Street as possible. Purpose, this would provide room for additional parking near the two care facilities in the neighborhood. Um, so I still need a motion to take this up off the table. So moved. So, second. Thank you, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, Aye. Councilor Hernandez, this is your order. Do you want to um, begin the discussion? Um, well, I mean, this order was filed by both um, Councilor Bartley and myself, and it's just to, uh, create more space for the two care facilities in this neighborhood for more parking. And um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure where it stands as to if the uh, DPW has um, weighed in on it or not. I think they so I'm not sure. There is a um, communication from so Bob Parent, the engineer, and I'll read that into the record. Okay. Um, he writes that this is an easy one, sort of. There are no entries in the ordinance table to support the current sign that is, that is about 50 feet southeast of the Cabot slash Locust Street intersection. We could simply remove the sign if that's, what desi that's what's desired. City ordinances and state statutes prohibit parking within 20 feet of an intersection, so it is not necessary to post no parking if the 20-foot exclusion is what is required. The majority of intersections in the city are unposted, but on occasion we get re requests to post one anyway. So oh. he's saying that they're happy to take the sign out if you feel like that'll resolve the issue. Um, well, hopefully, I mean, sometimes people still park, you know, near the corner anyway. And, um, Hopefully there's not going to be any need like to add any like bump outs or nothing like that. Thank so you. So if we can go forward with um, um, taking out the sign and see how that works, that would probably be uh, most prudent now. Yeah, I, I agree. That sounds like the right way to go. And then if it remains an issue, then we can put some signage there. But the no parking 20 feet from corner is... 
Um, by, law, by law. Yeah. We're taking up your <coughs> street order at the moment, Council Bartley. Planning's late. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you want me to speak? Um, I could. Sure. We, ha we had some discussion, and I could tell you where we're at presently, and you could tell us if that, that'll work. Um, the engineer sent a communication, and the engineer said that he, they're happy to remove the sign. There's nothing on the ordinances that underlies that signage. Right. Um, without any um, ordinance change, there is already no parking from 20 foot feet to the corner. Um, but if you want there to be signage at that 20 foot mark, um, he's happy to do that as well. I'd rather not have signage there. That's that's two nursing homes across the street from each other. They parking's at a premium right there, and mm -hmm. I, I know the uh, the uh, families certainly would be very welcome to having that. There's just two, there's at least three spots right there taken up. I yeah. mean, I love how these illegal signs just get put up somewhere, but <laughs> these things happen in life. So. Uh, so it, it, it is, it's something I should have filed a couple of years ago, but I'm glad, I'm glad it's uh, getting taken care of now. So it seems that we can adopt the engineer's report. Is there a mo remove the sign? Yeah. So I'll make that as a motion that Second. we adopt the engineer's report and remove the sign as both makers of the order agree. Second. Correct. Um, there's a motion. It was made and, and seconded. All in favor? Aye. So moved. Aye. It's going to be a 5 to 0 vote. Planning and board planning board is with us, so we can return back to regular order. Okay. If I may. Oh, absolutely. We do have a person here um, on item number. Two. Two? Oh, no, sorry, it is no, three. No, three. three. And so I was wondering if there would be an appetite for the committee to go out of order and take up item three before we go to one and two. I'm open to it I'll if the um, planning board is. Oh. The planning board needs to convene its meeting here, um, call its meeting to order, and then we could take up items in the agenda. I don't see Mr. Kelly. I think the plan that the that Mr. Kelly might be at the planning conference room. Uh, he might be having technical difficulties here. Yeah, yeah. Gonna take a peek. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. We're great. Muted. Yep. Yeah, we've got a couple of us are over the uh, the planning board meeting room, and other folks are on Zoom or telephone. But um, you should you should all be present. Who am I missing? Um, Is Tony still with us? He probably won't be calling in for the zoning portion. Okay, then there's uh, there's four members of the planning board. I'm ready, Mr. Kelly. The ordinance committee has already convened um, and we were taking up some regular business outside of the joint hearing, Mr. Kelly. So if you want to um, call your, your meeting to order. Um, there was also a, a request since we have a member of the public here for item number three that we proceed out of order, um, but deference to the planning board. Okay, so we, we, we prefer to open up an item number three. So at this point, I entertain a motion from the Hoyt planning board to open a public here, join public hearing with the city council uh, or ordinance committee to take up a uh, zone text change, uh, section 71065, marijuana language, uh, 71053A, table four, uh, three, uh, principal uses, introduced by Councilor Lisi. Is there a second on the motion? Um, have we made a motion? So moved, if not. Yep, okay. All those in favor? We need a second. Aye. Yeah, the, the, uh, Kate, Kate made the motion and Mimi seconded the motion. Uh, I'm going to need that on a voice from now on, okay, so I can hear the recording. Sorry, I so, thought you could hear me. I made the no, motion. Kate and Mimi, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, so if Kate made the motion, I will second it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, Councilor Lisi, we're all set. Go ahead. Thank you. So, we do need to, um, I, we do need to 
take up item number three and open the public hearing as well. So Right, so I'd like to make a motion to go out of order and take up item three and open the public hearing. Second. Second. Mo motion to suspend the necessary rules um, and proceed out of order to item number three. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. And then um, on the motion to open the public hearing, which was made and seconded as well. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Um, as the maker of the order, I will um, start the discussion. Given the multiple uh, electronic documents that were circulated at the time of the passage of um, the text changes to the marijuana ordinance about uh, three or four months ago, uh, there was a Scribner's error of sorts. So um, there were two of them, in fact. So one is um, site plan review process is not um, the planning. I'm sorry. So there's not a site plan review process in the same way that it's a, a formal site plan review process, but we do want a permit review process. So that change needs to be made, um, as well as where we wanted to refer to a 200-foot buffer from any manufacturing zone. Um, we put instead the reference to the full Table 4.3 of principal uses. So this language does not reflect the conversation and intent that we had discussed and voted on at the last meeting. And uh, the planning department has been working with these text changes that um, really don't make any sense. So we need to correct these um, issues here. Does anyone from planning want to uh, add to that? Yeah. yeah, just to say this struck us as basically a technical corrections amendment. I think that in general we all knew what we intended back when we first approved this, or at least when we sent our recommendation. And you know, we knew that the city council might want to change some of our buffers. And I think you know one error crept in there and it was purely a Scrivener's error, as you say. The other was you know, our intent as we understood it with the review process was that the city council was obviously the correct permit issuer for whether a location was appropriate to a marijuana use and everything having to do with the community agreement around marijuana uses. And you know, that's not appropriate to planning. You know, the host community agreement is for you guys. On the other hand, it also seemed to us that planning technical work, the things like, you know, we've just come from one of these reviews, in fact, you know, how does the Sally Park port work? How many deliveries do you expect a week? Um, have you checked with Holyoke Gas and Electric to make sure that the gas supply you're counting on is actually there? You know, do you need to change something about the parking because there's a risk of traffic backing up there? You know, all of that is detailed, it's technical, it is work that the planning staff is really professional in and can do efficiently. And I think experience in reviewing these is that it's not particularly interesting. It doesn't change anything about an approved project, but somebody has to do it for these projects to work. And what we were trying to do with this draft was to arrange for the city council to have 100% of the information that needed to be submitted in case there was anything of interest to you there, but that once you all had approved the host community agreement and decided that the site was appropriate to a marijuana use, the whole mess of making all the details work should then tip over to us and we should go through something approximating our site plan review process. And the language that ended up in this draft obviously has confused people because assuming that everybody was on board with that, and you know, we certainly thought that the city council was, you know, there's been confusion about making it work. So you know, what I had assumed that we were going to do subject to city council approval was to work with our law department to try to make sure that the ordinance actually says what we intended it to say. 
Um, under discussion, Councilor Bacon. Thank you. So what I don't have for tonight is what the change would be to the language from what the language currently is. I'm not seeing any proposed language. And the other thing that I would add, because we have had discussions about buffers and what should or shouldn't be included, is that since the passage of this ordinance, there's been other information coming to light relative to the buffers and how other businesses and uses are being affected by this relatively new industry in our city. And so I think since we have a public notice posted and we're in a public hearing format, it does allow us the discretion to keep some of those buffers, um, particularly in light of the fact that we have some local businesses who are being negatively affected if we reinstate them at this point in time. So um, I'm interested um, in, as our public hearing progresses, to hear from the folks affected and so that we can consider that. And relative to the reference to the major site plan review, I'm, what I'm not understanding is, is the goal simply to remove those words and leave everything else the same, or is a, an edit of that section being recommended? Sarah Lee Councilor Vega wants to speak. I think he wants to clarify that. Um, thank you. I, I know you're not a counselor. I just, it's in my mind. I apologize. So I am going to recognize um, Councilor Anderson Burgos as a member of the committee, and then I'll uh, recognize uh, Aaron Vega, our uh, Chair of Planning and Economic Devo Devo Development. My um, apologies, Chair Lisi. I was just, I was letting you know that um, Aaron Vega had his hand raised. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Juan. <clears throat> Thanks, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Good evening. Good to see everybody. Um, I want to just clarify two quick things and um, make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'll go from the back forward in line with your amendment. So to Councilor Bacon's point, uh, and building on what Mimi mentioned, in section four, the establishment of the site plan application, nothing there is gonna change. That is the full mini site plan, if you will, if we go back to what we talked about the, that first meeting, I mean, all that stuff, the survey plan, the building, the evacuation, the details, all that stays the same. The only thing we're looking to change in this section is when you go under number five, the review process, A, would stay the same. That's the notification when it comes to city council to the rest of us. I'm um, sorry, when it comes to the city clerk, it comes to the rest of us. All we're looking to do is cut the lines of B. That's it. So, Because um, that indicates a full site plan review. You can keep number six. That may become B. I leave that up to the people who write the ordinance. Um, because if it's new construction, it obviously goes through a full site plan review. But as you know, most of this has been rehab. Mm -hmm. So we're not changing anything that we've been doing for the last two years when it comes to reviewing the special permit. And in fact, as we mentioned before, what Jeff Burkow was able to do, and along with the team here, was make sure that everything we had been doing was spelled out so that people who are applying know exactly what we're going to be looking for. The photometric plans, all that kind of stuff, right? The security plan. So nothing else changes. So. Hopefully that's gonna be an easy change because it's kind of duplicative. Um, again, if you just take out B under section five, that's all we're doing. That would be the real Scribner's error in my opinion. So that hopefully is an easy easy fix. So it's duplicative. We do more, we do all the, the special permit review, all that stays the same. So to Council Bacon's uh, question, all we're looking to do is just strike out section B. Um, so I only want to jump in here Count, to say I do, that I do have Councillor Vacan, Ms. Panich. We do have Councillor Vacan oh, in queue, and then um, I can recognize you if you like. So, just as a follow up, why do we care if it's out if it doesn't make any difference? I mean, was it making well? It does. It does. It does make a difference because right now developers more? have to do, would have to duplicate all the information they're providing to us one set of everything for the site plan review, an additional set of everything for, a spe for the special permit review, basically duplicating all the effort and involving. Okay. But it makes no other change. Okay, thank you. 
Well, I just want to clarify. So what, what we presently, what we want is that there's a review procedure, which is outlined in um, section, section four, A yep. through G. And then yep. that's, Nothing changes. that would be the um, work that goes into the document that's forward to us that says, here's the review of the application, here's the outstanding issues. Um, that's when we start looking at the special permit, which is under section 5A. Right now we're, we're looking to strike 5B because where major site plan review is triggered by new construction of a certain size, we have this in here for all permits in existing buildings. And while we do want a review to happen to make sure that there is um, like the enforcement of our conditions and whatnot, we do not need a full major site plan review. So I think one thing that you should clarify as the planning board is whether we're striking um, all of section B or just the um, procedure set forth under major site plan review, that one sentence within B. So and, and Councilor Vacant's going to follow up on the question, question that she was asking. All right, so I understand it doesn't change the work other than it might have to be done twice, except if it's done over here, it can just be given over there. So it seems like there's some other things at play. And this is why I always request a written document of what the current language is and next to it, a written proposed change so that I can understand it's hard for me to sit and look at choppy pieces back and forth. So before I can really vote on this, I'd like to see the documentation side by side and be able to, you know, just look at it. I just got stuff after I got out of work today, so it's hard to look at. Thank you. Are you looking to speak, Council Murphy? What's that? I'm good right now. Uh, Ms. Panich. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to completely agree with Councillor Vacon and say that the reason you're not actually looking at language is that there appears to have been a certain um, confusion, at least on my part, about what precisely we were doing here. You know, or legislation is hard to write. I think we all know that. And there are often unintended consequences or it doesn't come out exactly the way you wanted it to and you have to go back and do these technical corrections. But, you know, one of the things that I had hoped at least we could do tonight was clarify precisely what it was that the City Council wanted to see from a final marijuana ordinance. It was what I thought we wanted to see it turns out to be something rather different from what our planning director or OPED director thinks that we were doing. I mean, I was under the impression that we genuinely wanted to have two proceedings before two separate bodies not that applicants should be forced to submit the same information twice. You know, I think everybody should see everything at one stage. But my thought is, you know, once all of the information is in, we relieve the city council of the burden of having to rule on where the salary boards are. And we, you know, leave the planning board completely out of the inherently political questions of, does this use belong at this site? And part of the reason that there's a reference to major site plan review in there was that when we were looking at this in the first place, we thought, why copy all the language in major site plan review over if we can just incorporate the requirements by reference? Now, obviously, that didn't work as a drafting thing. But if it is the city council's will to actually be reviewing all of this themselves, you know, even with guidance from us, that's a different procedure and it needs different language from if we were going to bifurcate this proceeding and give some of the work to the planning board and some of the, you know, have we cleared this up decision making for, to the planning board. So that's why there isn't language before you. Um, I think we need to answer that question before we can write language that would satisfy either path. And, you know, I certainly don't mean to criticize the path that um, Aaron just suggested to us, but it's the first time I'm hearing it. So I was a little confused. Uh, Chair Lisa, can I, I don't have, I have no way raise my hand except this way for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chair Kelly. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I, th I think what my understanding, I think the intent of this basically is to um, be thorough. We realize that the decision on these is clearly rests with the city council. Uh, you know, be thorough, but also be able in some way to not put an applicant through duplicate processes and really, you know, drag out the time frame it would take uh, to get an application, you know, um, through the approval process. So I think, as is, uh, is, uh, uh, Mr. Vega said, you know, item number four, if you look at it, the site um, application requirements, you know, pretty much covers a lot of the, uh, the meat of what a site plan review would be doing. And then number five, the review process, you know, ties in all the different departments that would be weighing in on an application. But most importantly, it also ties in the expertise of the planning department staff, you know, to review, um, you know, these applications working in concert with uh, the city council and all the other departments. So my understanding is that is why um, there's been some discussion, you know, once all that is done, then why do we start the process all over with a, a full site, major site plan review? That's just gonna take another, you know, maybe matter of months it could um, for the same information to be reviewed, you know, a second time by a separate body. So um, I think we're really trying to be probably more um, thorough at the same time, business friendly uh, to applicants who are coming into the city. Thank you. And if I may, I'll just um, work to clarify where where I thought this language was leading us when, when we passed it. Um, so there was discussion of the need to um, follow up and make sure that the conditions that we put on a permit application were being met before the permit was actually being issued. So there, there is a desire for some sort of like review before the um, permit is issued. Uh, I don't believe that major site plan review is the right review, um, but we do want um, someone with some technical expertise and enforcement capabilities to say, you met all these conditions, you did everything that was outlined as outstanding in the letter from the planning department or from the engineer, and given that all these conditions are met, we can now permit you. Right, because we grant the permits, but they're conditioned on all these other things being met. And at this point in time, we don't have anyone doing that follow-up to ensure that all these other conditions are being met. So, so there, there, is a, there is a need for a review process. What that looks like is probably not major site plan review, but I don't think that we've outlined it clearly here either. I see a hand from Ms. Panich. I just, thank you. I wanted to maybe see if I could clarify that. Or what, is what you're suggesting something like um, the permit to go forward with a, or you want to see basically a site plan approval, if minor site plan, from the planning board before you permit a marijuana establishment? No, I think the, the way that the process has been running is fine, and that's everything is fine up through four, and then 5A is where the special permit um, hearing comes in. And every, everything is fine except for from through the hearing procedures, we do, we grant special permits conditioned on usually it's six to eight conditions. But then there's never any follow-up about whether or not this applicant has met those conditions and deserves to actually have permit in hand. We, I think, have been trusting the applicants to come forward and say, we've met all the procedures, I'm sorry, we've met all the conditions and now you know, we, we deserve our, our permit. Yeah, but we need some, or I'm sorry, I don't mean to jump in like this, it's just our procedures no, you, you, you have the floor, you have the floor and then I have Councilor Vacan in queue. Okay. The thing is, we have, you know, it seems that you're still asking for some procedure whereby whoever is checking up on all of the details is signing off. Yes. 
So that still is presumably correct or establishing a formal procedure whereby the planning board would do some sort of review. Yes, and I think to the point that Councillor, I'm sorry, that um, the planning director was making, we don't want to create a full site plan review. We don't want a duplication of documents. We want to essentially review what was submitted, what was conditioned, and whether those conditions are met. Yeah, and the intent here was never to duplicate a review. It was to have one set of documents that everybody would see and reviews done by separate bodies in their areas of expertise. So we may be getting to the same page here. And now, um, if you're all set, Ms. Yeah. Panich, I'll, I'll go to uh, Councillor Vacan. Thank you. So in the early days when we were doing these, we were getting all of the information before we granted the special permit. And then as mm -hmm. things evolved, we were getting letters from the different departments and they would have, making up the numbers, eight out of 10 things done, two things remaining to be done. And we began to say, we will grant the special permit with the condition that you complete this and that. Now, I mean, the other way that we could address it is not to grant the special permit until the letters come to us clean. Mm -hmm. And then we have an upfront thing and nobody has to run around and check. Now, when I went to look back, and I think the ordinance in Municode is not the current one, but when I went to yeah, look at it, the enforcement that I read in our current ordinance lies with the building commissioner once the special permit is granted. So I think we could easily resolve this by, I think we were trying to push the special permits through, you know, not be unreasonably delaying people for being able to apply to the commission, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think it would take care of the need to look after if we just made sure everything was right in the first place. So that's just another way that we could mm -hmm. keep it sort of the way it was. My recollection of the discussion was that the planning staff were doing all this work anyway, and we kept asking them to do the same thing over and over and over. And so my perception of what we were doing was putting it into the ordinance rather than just being silent on it because it was actually happening for every application. So that's, anyway, that's correct for what, for what that's worth. <laughs> that would be another way to solve it. I think. Any other discussion on this point? I can I'll just council Murphy. Yeah, I'll just make uh, one, one comment. And I mean, I have heard since I've been in that other office pretty frequently the need for us to streamline all of our permitting processes. So, uh, I mean, it would seem to me that this makes sense. If the planning board did all of their uh, site plan reviews and all of that kind of thing and said to the, before we gave a special permit, we, we've reviewed all the application, we've done all this information, uh, we, we believe this is gonna be a good thing for the city and it's gonna comply with all of our building permits, our engineering issues, our, our uh, water sanitation issues and everything else, uh, and then we would grant it. I mean, I, if we're going back and forth, and it sounds like that's what's happening, uh, that's just making it a longer, as, as uh, Chairman Kelly said, that makes it a longer process for the applicant. So if there's a way we can do it and still make sure that we're trusting the planning board's expertise, which is what we're doing in terms of the actual layout and construction. So, I mean, I, I'm certainly not gonna challenge their expertise in terms of that. So if I'm asking them to, you know, this has gotta happen, this has gotta happen, that's gotta happen. I'm assuming they're already planning on making sure that happens. So I, I'd be, fine if that was the first step went to the planning board and then it came for a special permit here and hey we're in agreement this is a good business and we're we've seen the plans and they've all been approved if that re reduce reduces one step and, and maybe reduces some cost uh for planners or for uh applicants i'd all be, be all in favor of that um, I would love to hear from um, the planning board um, and, and Chair Kelly in particular, but it's my understanding that to do site plan review, major site plan review is very expensive and very costly, and we don't typically ask 
applicants to do that unless there is already a permit of sorts in hand. Um, even for present projects that have site plan review, uh, we, they don't usually do that until there's a, a zone change and a, and a project underway. And so it is a very expensive project and to do full major site plan review. And so I don't, I don't see that um, expediting things or making things cheaper at all. I think simply what, what we need to do is have um, some follow-up to ensure that the conditions that we place on the permit, and we, we've been granting permits um, pretty, um, I think, efficiently. Uh, it's just that there, we're trusting, we're entrusting the applicant to meet the conditions in order to move, a, move ahead, and we don't have uh, an external check. Well, those, I mean, and, and those certainly are conditions that we do site plan review. You know, we clearly focus on those to make sure that they're discussed and they're incorporated into you know our, our final our final decision. But I'm almost listening here. I'm saying it's like we've got the cart and the horse here. You know, in, in which order that we want to put them in. And again, um, I, I think you know it's a case of where we want to be sensitive to the applicant and the cost. We want to be very diligent in our deliberations, um, and yet have a process that is expedient for an applicant. So, you know, um, I guess it's, it's kind of, for my mind, you know, where do we wait this as far as who's gonna do, you know, what body's gonna do the majority of the, uh, the review here and the work in, and I mean, this is, you know, site plan review is something, that's what we do. You know, that's just, that's uh, what, what you know, planning is all about. But I think this did come about because um, I think there are other individuals who probably want to have more of a hands-on um, in this in this process, and that's where we've gotten to with this document. Thank you, um, Ms. Krukemeyer has her hand up. It seems to me. I mean, I think one of the arguments for having site plan review is that then uh, necessary items for public safety are dealt with and some of the complaints that I think that we heard um, for instance the argument right now that's being made that we ought to rethink the buffers because there are negative impacts on abutting properties that is something that without knowing all the details might have been taken care of if those properties had had to go through site plan review, uh, which they didn't have to do, um, if I'm understanding correctly. I, I think that there's a role to have um, the, to, to make sure that um, applicants are uh, abiding by the planning regulations in these cases. If I, if I may, Councillor Alicia, I think that, um, you know, the issue of the buffer has to be really be written into the, the uh, city ordinances, and then we deal with those. But I think the buffer is kind of a separate separate issue yeah. that has written into regulation. We're talking here process versus, or, versus ordinances. And I, I, I'm sorry, I just got to jump in for a second. I'm, I, all those concerns are in the special permit review. The public safety, the ease. I mean, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm still getting a little bit confused, and it still says, you know, a new major construction would do a site plan review. We don't need someone who's rehabbing a building to have a full site plan review. Right. They'll have the special permit review, which is very well spelled out mm -hmm. and in line with everything the city council is is in need of. If you're talking about an additional thing on the back end, that's a separate issue. There's no order in front of us today to talk about that. We're, we're not looking at a full, we, we're not prepared to go digging into this entire ordinance. I think we're prepared to look at the two sections tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it was brought up, I forget who mentioned it, but it's correct. I mean, I've dealt with companies trying to get their CEO and it's the building commissioner that holds them back saying you haven't, you haven't met these conditions. So we are reviewing these after the fact as they try to get occupancy. Our building commissioner, I've worked with him on a couple of projects already, and you know we've made some applicants who were very eager to open have to wait till they got things done. Mm -hmm. um, so there is the back end 
review. Now, whether it's a year later or something like that, and we have issues across the board on that kind of stuff that are in special permits and special and site plan reviews that often developers don't do, that's a separate issue. But as far as getting the special permit checklist done and vetted, they're not getting a certificate of occupancy until those things are checked off. So I guess I'm still just a little bit confused as to which, which path we're trying to go down. So um, what I hear what I hear you saying then to answer the the question that we that I started with was we can strike all of section B not just the second part that says major site plan review because the um, review of the conditions and compliant compliance of the conditions is happening happening through the building commissioner and the issuance of the CO certificate of occupancy that's that's what I hear you saying so there is a review that our conditions are being met and that would allow us to strike all of section B. That is my understanding. <laughs> and when you say all of section B, it's one sentence. So I just want people at home who are, we're, we're not talking about, we're talking about one sentence when you say all of section B. I just want to make sure people who maybe don't have it in front of them realize we're not we wholesaling an entire chop. It's a one sentence. Can we read After section B? I'm to just read it. <laughs> I'll read it into the record. So section B, um, section 5B, marijuana facility site plan review. Upon receipt of a complete application, the planning board will review the application under the procedures set forth for section 10.0, major site plan review of the Holyoke Zoning Ordinance and any relevant provisions of MGL Chapter 40A. So the, there's a motion now to strike all of section B, this one sentence because it seems that there is a review, that review of our conditions is being um, met by the building commissioner uh, upon the issuance or the request for a certificate of occupancy. Thank you, Chair Lisi, for reading that into the record. Yep. Councilor Vacan. Thank you. I just wanted to understand um, the technical definition relative to major site plan review and any other kind of a site plan review? Or is there only a special permit review or a major site plan review? Because my understanding when we crafted the language in the ordinance currently in effect is that we were kind of going somewhere between a major site plan review. That's um, what I understood. But doing enough of it where the city council wasn't trying to be the planning department. But I think yeah. this is the, the permit, I'll, I'll let them speak actually. So I'm just wondering, I, is it either a major site plan review or a special permit plan review and that's it? Yeah, I, yes, because if you look at section four, that's exactly, the marijuana establishment site plan application requirements is the site plan review light, if you will. Okay. Everything that's in the special permit is reviewed. And You're exactly right, Councilor. It's either or, unless it's a brand new building, then it automatically triggers a site plan review if they're building okay. a brand new building, which, which is what is said in what's now called six. Okay. New construction, obviously, if it's new construction, it's a full site plan review and a special permit review. Okay. And so within your department, there's no other in-between process that can happen. I defer to Jeff and Jack, but I believe no. It's special permit reviews that we do or, or site plan review. Okay. All right. That's just I, and I only am asking because I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I'm learning too. <laughs> Ms. Panich. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have two basic clarifications here, I think. First, to the point about whether it's either or. At the moment, yes, we have... You know, you've got the special permit process. We have a major site plan review ordinance. Mm -hmm. There's no reason that can't change because of course the city council passes ordinances and an intermediate or different process could be set up. And I think that that was originally part of what was being attempted here. The reference to major site plan review where no other, or where it wouldn't be triggered otherwise was basically back when this was written a time-saving measure intended to incorporate anything from site plan review that happened to be applicable to a given project, because of course projects vary a lot, that wasn't already being caught. And you know, we do site plan review and some of the time 
things that are listed in the major site plan and view ordinance are completely irrelevant and we just don't address them. You know, there are things where traffic isn't an issue and we don't have to ask for traffic studies. And, you know, we don't put applicants through that if they don't have to. It can be a grueling process for a really big project where there are lots of problems, or it can be something where it's simple and an applicant is in and out. But, you know, as to this, I see no reason why, if it's the city council's will, we couldn't actually craft something that's in between. You know, if there are things that need to be added in the experience or from the experience we've had so far in dealing with them, they can be added. You know, references to major site plan review that are just confusing people can be struck and a new intermediate process, if that's the will of the city council, could be set up. I mean, there's no reason it has to be that way. But, you know, what it's there for is not to ensure that applicants are raked over the coals. That was never the intention of the drafting. It was just a time-saving measure and a catch-all. Okay. Can I ask one more clarifying yep. question? So on the enforcement, we're now saying that the building commissioner is the enforcement person in terms of issuing the CO. However, in our path of granting special permits, I don't think it even go, does it go to the building commissioner when we grant the special permit with these conditions so that it's in that department before granting the CO? I just haven't been aware of that being the path. Um, I wonder okay. if Jeff Burkott might be able to answer that question um, because I know uh, there is a lot of review that's happening of these projects. So I mean, uh, is the question that I mean, I know that once the special permit is granted, the, uh, a copy goes or CC to the building commissioner, mm -hmm. and presumably prior to the grant of any building permit or final, uh, whether it be TCO or CO, presumably he is reviewing those items mm -hmm. okay. prior to the final sign off. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that because I just wasn't sure where everything was going at the end. Thank you, Mr. Burkett. Thanks, Jeff. And if I can add just one quick thing to that, um, one of the things that Jeff was able to build into the special permit review process was the pre-app meeting, mm -hmm. which became best practices and we wanted to solidify it, as you mentioned, Council Baking, you know, solidifying what we were doing. And at that pre-app meeting, the building commissioner, the fire department, the police department, our city engineer, I mean, everybody's there. And so they hear from everybody their concerns and they make connections with everybody as they're gonna move through the process. So that is such a key part now of the special permit review process. Before it was just sort of a best practice that we, we offer every developer, but now it's in the ordinance. So to your very point, every, every permit that you guys are granting is coming to every department. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, let's move Excellent. discussion to the um, buffer. Thank you, um, Council Lisa. Oh, so of course, uh, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, I just want to, you know, also, if you look at uh, this proposal in front of us, number five, the review procedures under special permit, I mean, it tells you it goes out to, for common, the building department, the fire department, police department, engineering, water, board of health, planning board, by the way, and stormwater authority and conservation commission. So it's not like anyone's really left out of loop here at all. Thank you. I just want to bring um, that in there is, you know, you go around whether, you know, how, how does planning board weigh in? It says we're going to see the city within that 21 day, you know, uh, application period. So we would be able to go back with some comments. Although it won't be a major site plan review, there are things we'll probably, you know, we can help focus on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so moving the discussion to the other part of this order, which is um, the 200 foot buffer. Um, the way the ordinance reads now is that the 200 foot buffer, sorry, let me find it. Section three locations. Yeah, thank you. So three location, section A and MME shall not be located in buildings that contain any residential units including transient housing, such as hotels, motels, and dormitories, any MME shall have a 200 foot buffer from any other use as listed in table 4.3, table of principal uses. Um, this, is not, <laughs> this is not what we 
wrote or intended, so I, I am confused about how this um, got in here. I believe that it was um, a, a 200 foot buffer from any um, school or location where children congregate. That was the original language that we were considering. So um, I know that there are folks here who want to speak on this language in particular, uh, but the, the, the language that I think we talked about and, and actually uh, adopted through our meetings and conversations was that uh, 200 feet from any school or location where children congregate regularly. Um, if there's no other discussion from committee members or um, planning board members on this item in particular, I would uh, move to open the public hearing and allow the public to speak. So moved. So moved. We're, we're open for the public, but um, allow the public to speak at this point. Mm -hmm. Can I say one thing before you do that? Or, Absolutely, um, Mr. Okay. Vega. So, so thank you. And, and so you, you are correct. Um, that was, I thought the original intention was uh, due from schools, which is, which is fine. Um, our only, and, and this conversation may need additional time after public comments, and maybe not tonight, but I would say, I think there's some fine tooth combing needs to be done if we wanna increase a buffer to any other uses. My concern would be establishments that are already open. Um, if we suddenly say this location was good and now it's not, um, it's a different situation obviously going forward than any, any, pro, any proposals that come forward to us, but just being cautious of, of what that will have, what the intent will be. So, um, you know, we have the residential in there. Um, so adding the schools, what we believed was the intent, but if there's other uses, um, I think that they just it would need to be spelled out. I think it was mentioned earlier. So not just, you know, saying every use. Um, and again, it's just, you know, it's a unique situation that we have in Hoyoke and with the city council, you know, and us, you know, limiting this to IG, you know, traditionally, you know, our IG is also has residential in it and it's intermixed and it's a, it's a you know, it's a difficult downtown. Uh, and obviously the history of Hoyoke, you know, is ingrained in us. And, you know, that's why we have a lot of brownfields. It wasn't exactly, you know, we talked about the heyday of the businesses here in the turn of the century. And it exactly wasn't the most environmentally friendly place uh, to raise your family. But, you know, thankfully we have different eyes today and look at things differently and try to have protected air and water. So, um, but just keeping that in mind that if there are additional buffers, um, we would definitely want a little more time to, to look into that, how it will affect at least the currently open businesses or the permanent businesses that have already been approved. Um, so I just want to throw that out there um, and look forward to the discussion. So if there's members of the public here who wish to speak, um, you come to the microphone. Uh, it's likely needs to be turned on um, and then just state your name and address for the record. Okay. Um, Jeffrey. Oh. Yep. So anyone who wishes to speak needs to raise their hand. You would go to um, more or the three dots on your screen or uh, the reactions button and look for the raise hand feature. You could also, if you're dialing in, press star nine to raise your hand. Madam Chair. Can, can I just make up a, a quick point of order? Absolutely. Uh, I, I tell you, the counselor who came up with this idea to put the screens right here is absolutely brilliant. Oh, it was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can actually see it without cranking my, it's, it's so clear and crisp, it's great. So th thanks again to Jeff and to. Uh... So we do have Regina that raised her hand is, to speak. Okay. Um, Regina, you're being recognized to speak. You'll need to see your full name and address for the record. Okay, hi, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, my name is Regina Demond. I am with Mill One at Open Square um, on what, at 110 Lyman Street. Um, and I'm just going to turn off my video real quick because, <laughs> or at least my view. Um, so just kind of piggybacking off of what Aaron was just saying um, in regards to the 200 foot buffer zone. So um, the the application for a facility that is you know up for discussion is within yards of, of Mill One. Um, so I'm the event manager at Mill One and I book um, weddings, um, a lot of different events that bring in at least 5,000 people a year to Holyoke, um, many of whom 
have never actually been to Holyoke before. So, so we're actually bringing in a lot of people from outside Holyoke. Um, one of the concerns that I have is we, we've already had a, a few couples booking our space who have commented that the reason they came to us is because they were looking at a similar space in East Hampton. Um, you might all be familiar with that. And it, that space happens to have a growth facility um, inside. Sorry. And the reason they came to us is because they said it was very noticeable, the, the odor that was coming from the facility. So the, one, of, one of the concerns that we have is that the, the odor that might be coming from this facility, again, within yards of our event space, would actually affect potential people who would book the space for the venue. Um, so when I tour couples, I mean, they're looking at everything, not even just the space, they're looking at the, the parking lots, the, um, the curb appeal, they're looking at everything in the city itself. Um, they're looking at places to stay, they're looking at what's around us. Um, and I think we all know that unfortunately, the, the flats has had a bad stigma in the past, um, which I think a lot of improvements have been made um, along the canal district to, to help mitigate that. And I think some wonderful improvements have been made um, to help build up the area, which has been appealing to a lot of um, tourists coming in. But I feel like, um, at least from my view, Point from what I've been is this facility would actually be a step backwards for our business. Um, parking would certainly be an issue if that goes in our store. So that's also something that we'd want to consider. Um, so just a few things that, that we're looking at that would actually affect our business quite a bit. Um, we're already looking at a pretty uh, reasonable growth, um, at least 20% from years past and we're already recovering from, you know, an, an awful year of 2020. So um, we just don't want to take another hit with a building that might be going across the street. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, looks like, are you all set, Regina? Um, yeah, that, okay. that was pretty much the bulk of what I wanted to say. Um, I don't know if you have any, have any questions for me. Um, you know, we, like I said, we're, we're just making a lot of improvements to grow. That's the whole point of kind of why I want to come in here is, is we're actually planning on growing quite a bit, bringing in even more people than the 5,000 that we're already bringing in a year, um, including a $65,000 investment, you know, to do like a deck around our building. So um, I just wanted to voice my concerns because I don't want that to be another hit to our business after going through a pretty terrible year. Thank you. Um, I saw a hand from Jake. I do see Councilor Hernandez that you have your hand up. What I think we should do, however, is allow all members of the public to speak first and then um, take questions. Yeah, sorry about that. No, not at all. Yeah. We have Jake? Janet Blake. Oh, Janet Blake. Hi, Janet, Janet, can you hear me now? now? Are you hearing me now? Yes. Okay, now I'm not hearing you. Yes. We can hear okay, you. Okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Janet Blake. Uh, my address is 163 Falmouth Road uh, in West Springfield. I am a tenant at uh, Open Square um, in Reggie and John Aubin's building. And I recently opened uh, Comfort Bagel uh, in the space there. Um, John has asked me to speak. Uh, I've, I've only been open since July. I opened as a, as a cottage bakery in West Springfield and I was only um, delivering at the time, um, but it became obvious that we needed to move into a retail space. And um, when I came to Open Square, um, I was attracted, one, to the space, uh, but two, uh, Holyoke's commitment to revitalizing um, the Canal District. Um, there were other businesses that uh, affected my decision, Blue Door Gatherings and Avalon, which are all food establishments as well. Um, currently, I'm open three days a week. Uh, I have a built-in customer base that I brought with me from primarily West Springfield uh, Westfield and Agawam, 
and um, that's about 2,000 people. And um, now that we are open, we are bringing in um, people every day uh, from surrounding communities that would never have come to that uh, location uh, if we had not opened our business there. Uh, so, you know, my concern is obviously being so close to that building and all of the evidence that, you know, uh, a marijuana growing facility, uh, the, the aroma, <laughs> uh, which is a nice way of saying it, um, extends to up to a mile away. Um, and, you know, I, I'm very fearful that that will affect my customers, uh, you know, excitement to come and eat food in my establishment. Uh, we're looking to go to more of a four to five day um, schedule. And I am currently seeing over 200 people uh, coming into my establishment every day. Um, they are also visiting other businesses such as uh, the Holyoke Children's Museum. They are going to, on Saturdays, they're going to the farmer's market. Um, I am helping, you know, my business and the people that work with me are helping to bring in uh, foot traffic uh, to an area that people didn't know about uh, until I opened. And I lastly just want to say that to open this business, uh, I invested about $100,000 uh, in purchasing equipment. And currently, um, I have a very uh, short lease with John, uh, you know, as a test to understand the viability of this project or this business. And um, I would be very hesitant uh, to sign a long-term lease knowing that this could impact uh, the success of my business. Thank you so much. You. Is there anyone else online that has their hand raised? Not at the moment. Uh, I'll note if somebody is on phone and wants to raise their hand, they would hit star nine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, given that there's no one else online, uh, I welcome the one guest that's in our chambers here. Um, again, the micro microphone would need to be turned on um, and name an address for the record. Push the button. It's slides. It's and slides. How's that? Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is John Aubin. I am the manager and principal owner of Open Square. I'm also the manager and one of the owners of Echo Hill Apartments up the street. Um, I, Open Square is a, a mixed-use complex in the center of Holyoke. Uh, our building is where Holyoke started, where the Lyman Mills started. Um, and if I were to uh, say very simply what we do, I would quote the current revitalization plan for the city of Holyoke, which is connect, construct, and create. Um, I've been working on Holyoke for over 22 years, um, building a mixed-use uh, development. Um, it is a slow uh, and steady process. Um, and I have to say, uh, I have not had more confidence uh, than I have today than in the last 10 or 12 years um, in terms of where we're going with it. We have over 40 tenants. Some of our recent tenants include GPMF, which is an expansion of a tech company to about 10,000 square feet. Um, they own four or five companies, including one called Baytech, which is a partnership with Bay State Hospital. Um, they have uh, employees in some of their businesses. The majority of the employees are earning over six figures. We recently brought in Xenox, which is a tech manufacturer that makes x-ray machines for industry and universities, starting at three quarters of a million dollars. Um, they started with 8,000 square feet and are expanding uh, with an additional 5,000 square feet. That construction is ongoing currently. Um, we have been expanding our hospitality. Um, we actually have two separate companies. One is uh, called Open Square, but we call it Open Square Hospitality, and that is our event space, the cafe and future developments. Uh, in 2018, we had HVS an international hospitality consulting group, do a hotel study for us for mill number two. 
what they told us was it's viable. Not yet, but it is viable. And we have a, a basic ground plan for developing a 100-room hotel in Mill 2 when the time is right. This past year, um, we currently have a deck being constructed on our cafe. Uh, with that deck, uh, we've invested 100000 over $100,000 in our hospitality sector, uh, including new air conditioning, new uh, furnishings for the event space, new fencing outside, um, and improvements to the cafe to um, welcome in Comfort Bagel. Um, in the next two years, we have a half a million dollars in projects um, ready to go. Uh, these are already funded. We're not looking for money. We don't have to borrow the money. These are funded and ready to go. It includes eight new studios on the second floor. The second floor of Mill 4, we're dedicating to uh, creative businesses. They rent for uh, about 60 to 70 percent of what our Class A office space rents. We do that on purpose. They're simpler spaces, but they bring in small creative businesses that can't afford as much, and they add culture. Open Square is all about urban culture, about density, about different people mixing together and different businesses mixing together. Other uh, improvements included in that half a million dollars, we're renovating, renovating our own office, which will serve as a showroom at the entrance for what our um, Class A office lofts look like. The back area of our new office is going to be a large conference room, 20 by 30 with a full kitchen. It is going to be our preliminary marketing for residential lofts. It's designed so when people come in, they look around and say, oh, do you have any lofts? Um, the event space, uh, as Reggie mentioned, um, we are, our next project after this deck for next spring is a deck that wraps around the event space. I think the total is over 150 feet long. Um, we think that will be a major addition, that exterior space for um, our events. And we do other things besides weddings also. For the last two years, we have hosted the city's school department as they welcome in new teachers. Um, we've hosted events for Girls Inc. Um, we have uh, uh, several nonprofits in the building. We think they are also an integral part of our plan. Um, in terms of marijuana manufacturers, now, I have long supported the legalization of marijuana. I will be very straightforward about that. Um, there, I have no issue at all with retail marijuanas, uh, retail marijuana establishments. Um, Manufacturers, we have a lot of experience with manufacturers. GTI, the first manufacturer to come into the city of Holyoke, approached us. We had a number of uh, talks with them and actually put a proposal together. They were gonna go in the lower levels of mill one and mill four. We had most of our tenants on floors above. GTI assured me that they had the technology to filter out all the odors. Um, as we were going through the process with them, I know they were looking at other spaces. We, uh, I started to do some research. Normally I do that kind of extensive due diligence way ahead. And I started to read things that uh, indicated that what they were saying was maybe not 100% true. And in fact, uh, at that time especially, um, there was no way they were gonna be able to mitigate odor between floors in an old mill. And had we leased to GTI, Open Square today would have no other tenants. But because of the emphasis on marijuana in the city of Holyoke, we could not ignore it, even though uh, uh, growing was not necessarily aligned with best uses of our mill. So we have, over the years, talked to many, many potential manufacturers, especially the larger ones. Uh, I'm going to guess we've had over 200 inquiries from mostly uh, manufacturers and growers of marijuana. Um, and uh, we do not turn them away. We talk to them. We require uh, full floors. Uh, I think it's a myth that I heard recently that there's no space available in Holyoke for marijuana. We have several hundred thousand square feet that potentially could be used for it. 
floor, floor uh, plans of 18 to 30,000 square feet. And we have indeed talked to uh, many large, well-funded, uh, very experienced growers of marijuana. And what we say to them is, we will consider you in this separate wing. If the odor goes to the floor above you're gonna, and you're not renting it, you will rent that floor. We want to see in detail your plans for mitigation, and you must guarantee that our office tenants, that our retail tenants, and that eventually our residential tenants will not smell marijuana. Now, coming in their door, they're all promising the technology and the modern miracles of uh, odor mitigation and that they can do it. But when we put that in as a requirement that's going to bind them, they all walk away. The most recent one was January, I believe. Um, and from our own experience, we know that it's extremely unlikely that any of these people can do this. And in fact, they can't. All you have to do is walk down to GTI or to True Leaf and smell. Uh, all these locations are emitting odors as we speak. They cannot uh, not emit odors. I understand that as a business person, as someone who deals with multiple kinds of tenants. We're always screening our tenants for two things, not just marijuana. All our tenants get screened for noise and odor. Um, and we are learning ourselves how to deal with small issues of noise and odor because we know as we do residential units, we have to do it. But the scale of the odors in manual, marijuana manufacturing are not controllable at that level. They need to be segregated in an industrial area. Marijuana growers in our neighborhood and next to any uh, similar business will damage any retail office uh, or hospitality business. The city's revitalization plan, again, connect, construct, create, uh, is meant to grow the kind of businesses that we have. And they are fundamentally at odds with manufacturing of, of marijuana. Um, a buffer is a common sense uh, way to address this. Now, I understand that uh, the buffer as written is uh, being blamed on a mistake, but the truth is it's not a mistake. It is the right thing to do. It was something that I'm actually grateful that the Ordinance Committee passed. If you look in the video, by a five-member vote after it was carefully read, um, and by the way, that's the same with a special permit. Uh, it's on the April 13th meeting. So it wasn't a mistake. And I think the truth is it's been overlooked. Uh, there's been a lot of enthusiasm for marijuana. It has a, a lot of benefits to the city as an industry. It brings in taxes and jobs. But it's not a revitalization plan. And the revitalization plan we have is very good. It brings in not only jobs, of a variety of levels, including uh, uh, much better paying jobs. It brings in so, uh, uh, social interaction, it brings in culture, uh, it brings in lively, uh, a lively community, and it brings community together. So it's really critical that I think um, a moment be taken to look at this buffer as what it is. It's needed. I know there's a desire to push forward and push back the buffer to the schools only, but I have to tell you, quite frankly, as optimistic as I am, if that happens, I cannot rely on what will happen next. I cannot rely on having to go to a special permit. It's going to take time and money that I should be spending on development, um, but I will spend because I've spent the last 20 years developing a plan that is right in sync with the city's revitalization plan. I've invested uh, all of my energy and it continue to invest in this operation. And there is no reason that marijuana as an industry in Holyoke, a viable and a productive and a contributing industry cannot coexist with revitalization. But marijuana, 
generates taxes and some low paying jobs. The revitalization plan generates much more. And if there is not a buffer, if we revert to this sort of open access to manufacturers, and I have to be clear, this is strictly for growing and manufacturing, if the city does that, you are saying to the world at large that our redevelopment, uh, redevelopment plan is marijuana. It's not revitalization. It's not connect, construct, create. It's marijuana. Because I know personally, uh, if, if there are not adequate buffers, um, not only will I fight for them, but eventually I'm going to have to look and reevaluate um, what I'm planning to do. So um, I'm, uh, I've, as part of this, obviously we want a solution to this. What I've done is I've proposed uh, a rewriting of that uh, buffer ordinance. I mean, it's obvious that as written, it doesn't allow anything. That's not the point. Um, but as a reasonable buffer to help rev re revitalization rather than hinder it, I've rewritten that buffer to say, um, and I've handed it to everyone so uh, uh, someone can read it there. But basically, uh, there should be a 200-foot buffer for all uses except, and those exceptions are, of course, ones related to manufacturing, storage, and other uses that are not going to be damaged by the smell of marijuana um, or the potential health hazards uh, down the road of um, marijuana in the atmosphere. Um, so I ask the um, ordinance committee to please consider what I've uh, done. All I've done is taken what was written, which as I said, it isn't a mistake, it's the right thing to do, and make, made it so it will work for manufacturing um, as a industry that is compatible and helpful to the revitalization of Holyoke, not a hindrance. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Hernandez, you had a question earlier, so you're in queue. Okay, next. Yeah, no, it actually, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it was um, relating to what one of our speakers, Ms. Regina, was um, speaking of, um, of her business. And I just wanted to ask, um, if it was relating to the buffer and if the buffer would benefit her expanding her business and whatnot. But then uh, furthermore, uh, my constituent from Ward 4, John Ob, and he clarified it through his speech there. So I know that what they're looking for um, is for, the, for that buffer to remain in place so it doesn't hinder their businesses or their customers with the um, odor mitigation type of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vega. Um, thank you, and, and thank you, John and Regina, and the owner of Comfort Bagels. Thank you for bringing the business here. And John, thank you for the conversations we had over the last week. And I'm, I'm really excited about what's happening at Open Square. Obviously, we've always seen that um, as a key location. Uh, for downtown revitalization and uh, everything you presented was 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 well done. Um, we're not you know we're not opposed to working with the city council and with the businesses. I don't have a copy of what was of what's before you, um, but you know I think that there's 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 a there's a path here forward. Um, again, before anything is done, though, I would really want the time just to double check. Um, some of the permits that are already in place and some of the businesses that are in place. Um, I also just want to note that one of the key locations that Open Square is concerned about, I want to go out and, and measure because as was mentioned, Echo Hill is right there. And so perhaps, you know, we're not, we're not mentioning it at all about removing the 200 foot buffer uh, from the residential establishment in that section. So there may even be a path there uh, with, the, with the major concern that they have uh, right next to them. But I just want to review that as well. So just want to put that out there that um, I thank John and his team. I look forward to working with you on the implementation of what you guys have going on. It's exciting. Um, and again, I think we can look at um, ways to make this work for all parties. Councilor Vagan. Thank you. Um, some of our earlier discussion relative 
to compliance around the special permit and the comments that have been made by a couple of the business um, representatives relative to odor. Um, it has been brought to my attention and in recalling our original crafting of the ordinance, we do have language in there. It, it actually says that no order from marijuana cultivation, processing, or consumption can be detected by a person with an unimpaired and otherwise normal sense of smell at any adjoining use or adjoining property to the marijuana establishment. So we do have language in our ordinance that recognize that that could be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I will say it's very broad and general, but on the other hand, if it errs in any way, it errs on the side of not being too stringent because it says if you can smell it, you can smell it. So we come full circle back to the whole enforcement discussion relative to what we're approving and relative to the ordinances that people say they will comply with. Now, the ability to comply is another question. And I think we're finding out as the industry matures that that's a challenge that hasn't actually been successfully met yet. And some people are saying one of the reasons we're getting so much interest is because people are getting denied in other areas given some of these concerns and the tightening of ordinances that have occurred because of them. So I think it would be prudent of us to try to do more than just simply look at a number and a buffer in looking at this and sort of try to figure out how we can all live together, if, if you will, because we want to have the business, but on the other hand, we don't want to harm the other businesses. And there's, these are just the unintended consequences, which as we gain experience, we figure out and then have to modify. Um, what I'm not sure of is if under this particular order in this particular public hearing, you know, if the discussion about a buffer relative to the odor then brings us into the other part of the ordinance where we can do something. Um, if it does because they're related and connected, um, I think it would be a good opportunity for us to write in language that says a business will use every technology advanced technological development available to them to meet the ordinance, not just, hey, yo, I got my permit, I'm good. And, you know, they didn't have that then. You know, it's sort of like the filtration of the air. You know, first you didn't have them and now you have a HEPA filter kind of thing. Um, so if we had that opportunity to do that, I think that could be a win-win for the longer term. So I'd like to put that out there and if it's something we can build on, then I think it would be great to do. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have one more speaker um, with the warehouse for public comment. Um, what I would say, just to piggyback on what Councilor Bacon was saying just then, was that, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, when we did the full review of the marijuana ordinance, um, there were a number of things that we sidebarred because we felt that there should be a specific discussion about those specific elements. For example, um, there was a discussion about whether or not we wanted to expand um, manufacturing uses into the IP, industrial park zone. Um, and because of the way that it was advertised, um, we decided that we, we shouldn't enact that change until we could have a full discussion about that issue and, and it was advertised as a discussion of that issue, and, and I'm feeling very similarly uh, around these changes here. Um, absolutely open to having a conversation about it. I'm, I'm glad that they were raised this evening, um, given the relation or potential relation to uh, a buffer, um, but I do think that it deserves its own order and its own public hearing because it, it does have a number of specific um, you know, carve outs that I think need to be discussed one by one through a, a more dedicated hearing and understand the, the pros and cons of each. Um, the one last question that I wanted to ask before we um, take up the, the next speaker or final speaker, um, Mr. Aubin, you were talking about um, GTI as the uh, project that seems to be pr producing the most odor coming into your building. And do you know how? far that that building is from from where you are 
Um, I, I didn't say GTI was producing odor that we could smell. Um, what I said was it, they are producing odor well outside of their building, as is um, True Leaf. Mm -hmm. But they're in locations surrounded by other industry and other manufacturers, which is appropriate. Now, they are violating the ordinance as it stands. They're violating it every day as it stands. Mm -hmm. And I'm not advocating for shutting down GTI or True Leaf. They are currently not in areas where there's residential. And I don't know. Uh, I know there are some businesses around them. Um, and I know people who go to those businesses can smell it. The, the types of businesses we typically attract aren't going to go for that. And I think most people aren't going to go for that. Our residential units, I do not see starting, I wouldn't even start a residential unit if uh, there was any regular marijuana smell in the air. I mean, who's going who's gonna to rent that? And, you, you know, you've heard from our own tenants who are going to consider, who are going to watch what the city council does with regard to this buffer. We may lose a tenant if the city council doesn't institute a buffer, which is very reasonable. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, it, it, this is very specific to urban revitalization and the uses that are urban revitalization and odors that are off-putting, but also, um, you know, I'm glad you brought it up because there are recent studies that's, that have started to look at the production of um, problems, of air quality problems emanating from uh, manufacturing and growing of marijuana that also suggests that dense areas uh, exacer exacerbate that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, Holyoke has had a history of air quality problems in the downtown. Um, the coal plant was closed recently, and I don't know if people remember, but for years, I mean, they spent millions of dollars on scrubbers and filters and the latest technology, and there were still air quality problems. So, I mean, that's something that the uh, scientific study on is, is early. Um, but, I mean, that's another reason. If it turns out that there are air, are air quality issues, the, the smell is just part of that. As the ordinance is, uh, as it was requested that it be, that it only excludes schools, uh, I'm aware of at least one proposed growing and manufacturing facility that will almost, uh, I'm quite positive, will have a multifamily residential building within 200 feet. And I don't think anyone um, uh, on this committee, on the council in the city of Holyoke, would want someone to have to live with their children in a building that has the smell of marijuana in the air every day. I, I just can't imagine that. So. I mean, I think this was just, you know, it's all come on us very fast, and uh, I think it was just, it's, it's oversight. And I know it's hard with all these applicants lined up, and, you know, uh, I, it, I think it's very likely that some current applicants will get, would get booted with a buffer. And it's not going to make people happy, but it's the right thing to do. If one applicant gets booted that would have uh, produced a smell of marijuana in a multifamily um, building with families and children in the flats or in the downtown area, I, that's a win. That's a win. So um, I hope I answered your question. You, you did. And I think, this, I think your response um, really points to the reason why this issue deserves its own um, order and advertised hearing. Um, because, you know, if you, if you are smelling, um, you know, the odor of cannabis and, and cannabis production um, in, in the area that you're at, is a 200-foot buffer enough? I mean, these are, these are the sorts of questions that are, that are up in the air. So, like, I mean, I can't think of anyone that's closer than GTI. I'm not sure. So, you know, if you're smelling it over there and... and we put in the 200 foot buffer, that probably wouldn't make a difference in that situation. So I do think that it just um, requires its own hearing. I'm going to um, Can I just respond to that? Um, I agree, I, I, I offer the buffer as an intermediary step. I think it's, the research hasn't been done. 
I would fully support a full suspension of all applications until this is resolved, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was offering the 200-foot buffer as a way to uh, get there without causing too much disturbance, but absolutely I agree with you and I would fully support suspending all applications for grow and manufacturing until the issues can be hammered out. Thank you. By the, by the way, the, the current uh, reading of the ordinance actually does that. Um, so the last uh, speaker that I know of is the warehouse. Um, we do need a name and address for the record. And then is there anyone else after that? Uh, there is no one else after that right now. So um, if the warehouse is there, you're welcome to yes. speak. We just need Hello. your name, name and address for the record. Samantha Curran, the address is 2 Curran Lane in Hoyoke. Thank you. Um, the address of the warehouse is 109 Lyman Street. Just to echo what John was saying, um, again, it's an industry, he and I both have a similar industry with customers and although Lots of people have a, a acceptance of the marijuana industry and all that it entails. There are people who don't. And I feel you need to take into consideration businesses that are fully established who have been in the city and doing what they've done in the city for years. And now we're hit with another thing that's going to impact customers coming in. It's not, I, I mean, I don't have a, a lot to say about it. I just, as you know, as John had said, it, it's, it's a true story that there are people who are affected by the smell, the industry and all that that entails. And it is going to impact our business, maybe positively in some ways and probably negatively in some ways. So it's just something I wish that the powers that be would consider, um, you know, along with this. I think what was said tonight about making it a, a special meeting, I think that's a good idea. I think it deserves some more inquiry for sure. Thank you. Is there Thanks. anyone else who wishes to speak this evening? Yeah. Any Anyone that has questions? Um, Council Murphy. Yeah. I. I you know, after hearing all of these things, uh, you know, I, I definitely think this is something that we need to revisit. Uh, I think we need to be a little bit more cautious in terms of uh, what we do. I, I certainly, if we are jeopardizing uh, other businesses that are already in existence, uh, we definitely need to take a step back and, and not, if we have any question about that, then we need to take a step back and, and not approve that special permit. I would also, uh, and it goes along with the quality of air in the lower wards, which I've been working, and I, and I don't know uh, if the, the smell uh, coupled with other things that are in the lower wards would make air quality worse, but I think that is something we should is there research on that that would indicate uh, that if we have manufacturing uh, in dense residential sections with poor air quality that in fact we are uh, lessening the air quality? And I don't know the answer, but uh, it's certainly a concern in the lower wards. It's a concern when I talk to the Hoyoke Health Center uh, in terms of air quality. So. I mean, I think we got questions, and I think we we need to be very cautious, uh, and we may need to extend, as you did indicate, Madam Chair, going beyond the 200. Uh, in, in terms of it, it would be other, other thing that would be interesting for me, and I don't know who would conduct this, would be all of the facilities that we currently have. <clears throat> how far does that? How far does that order carry? Uh, and what intensity does that that order carry? I mean, I think there's a lot of questions, uh, and I appreciate 
appreciate you, John, bringing uh, this to my attention uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, because I think, you know, we want to promote business on the one hand, but we don't want to jeopardize current businesses, and we certainly don't want to jeopardize uh, the neighborhoods. So I think we got to take a step back and, and be cautious and uh, review this again and try to get more scientific, scientific information in terms of health, but also make sure our, our current businesses are, are heard and that their objections uh, are, are clearly understood. Thank you. Councilor Vacan. Just Councilor one more thing. Um, relative to being able to discuss the odors relative to the buffer, I think is sort of critical to the discussion. And if there's concern that the notice doesn't let us go there, what I'd like to do is ask the committee to request legal to see if we would be within our bounds. Because this is language within the ordinance. It wouldn't be changing zoning. It would simply be looking at the current language. The IP issue is a completely new zone topic. This is currently in the ordinance. So if the committee is willing, I would just like to see if we would be within reason to also look at that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they could get back to us on that for the next mm -hmm. gathering that we have. Well, I would say it's, it's very clear. We, we absolutely could make any changes within the ordinance mm -hmm. that we want to. Mm -hmm. The okay. issue is, I would imagine that if we were advertising something that said, review the setbacks in relation to air quality, there'd be probably a, a, many more people from the community, perhaps residents that are close to uh, the existing manufacturing plants, perhaps um, folks that are part of the asthma coalition. I mean, I think there's a lot more people who would want to weigh in on that discussion who aren't going to have an opportunity to um, because it's not really the way that it was advertised. It's, it's the same, the move to IP, the move to uh, retail in an overlay zone, the move to a 200 foot buffer, it's all, it's all zoning. It's not just a zone that makes it zoning, it's all of these regulations that are zoning. We could, we could make all changes that we want to under the, the order the way that it was um, at least initially filed. Uh, I think t the, the point that I'm making here is that I think there's, a lot, there's many more people in the public who would want to weigh in on that conversation if we advertise it that way. And that may be a fair point. I just simply don't want it to be excluded as it relates to the issues of the buffer because I think it directly is part of that whole discussion. Thank you. Uh, Council Murphy, did you want to speak? No, I'm, I'm all set. Uh, anyone from planning? Is that uh, Mr. Vega with his hand up? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So just two two quick uh, points, and I, I want to make sure I don't put any words into to John's and his team's uh, presentation, but um, my understanding, my conversation with John, it wasn't that they currently can smell True Leaf or, or, or GTI, they're concerned about some operations that may be coming close to them because of IG. So I just want to, you know, so I just want to make that point. And if I'm incorrect, I'm happy to have John uh, step back and correct that. The other thing I want to say is that I had a meeting on Friday with a company called Bayer Scientific, um, who are dealing with this exact issue across the country. And we had a conversation with them about this exact issue, and there is um, potential for us to work with them on doing an air quality uh, survey. Uh, they work with a number of campus industries across the country, do, uh, do uh, testing, uh, recommendations. John's probably right. This, at this point, the technology is probably not able to get to zero smell odor emission from cannabis, um, but often there is better, pro better programs, better filter filtrations that maybe they're not using. Um, this could definitely be something that could help us with enforcement. So I will be meeting with them again and talking with Mayor Murphy about some uh, way to pay for a air quality survey. Um, so this may be something that uh, could be part of the conversation. So happy to include uh, anyone who wants to be a part of that conversation. Uh, but as we move forward, again, there could be um, some ways to uh, mitigate the cannabis odor that we're currently uh, having. Uh, and as the technology gets better and better, there may be ways to improve it. But um, so just want to let people know that we are actively in conversations uh, with people that are addressing this very issue. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Councilor Bartley. Yeah, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Boy, there's a, this is a really great discussion, so thanks to uh, the committee and everybody for, uh, and the public for coming. I'm, I'm gonna make, uh, hopefully I'll be very brief. Uh, so one, just through the chair to, um, to, um, to Aaron Vega. Um, so Aaron, w one of the things I would really be interested in, in is getting your perspective of your department as well as the acting mayors uh, per pursuant to, um, so the way I always look at zoning tr uh, is, is as follows. Uh, traffic, noise, parking lights. Those are the big four. However, we just heard tonight we have possibly a big five mm -hmm. with uh, odor. But traffic, noise, traffic, noise, parking lights. Boom, boils. That's how I always review it, and that's it. Always comes out to one of the four, but now odor as well. If we we're, we should be well served to remember that these are special permits, so they're not granted by God where you get them forever. They got to come back. Okay, they're, they're going to come back, and if they have to be amended by this body, they can be amended. But of course, we would, we would want to do it prudently and thoughtfully, Aaron. That's why we would need to have your input, and of course, the planning boards and the acting mayor, and I would think the Board of Health um, and, and others. So I just want to make that, uh, those two small points. And then um, one thing, Madam Chair, I always do when the marijuana industry comes in is that we always thank them for the investment. I, I've always, when I was on this committee, I, invariably said thank you for your investment. Well now, I want to, you know, of course this is to Mr. Aubin, John, John, and and um, and the entrepreneurs that were here tonight. I mean, talk about, um, talk about a headline somewhere. If, if this paper wasn't robbed of a, if this city wasn't robbed of a newspaper by by the thieves in Springfield uh, 20 years ago, when, when, they, when they croaked the Holyoke transcript, um, we would have a reporter here, and we would have a great story about what's the, the exciting things happening in Open Square with you know, bagels and, and weddings and, and medical manufacturers. And these are the kind of businesses and jobs that really are, are, are integral to a, a vibrant uh, business community. And uh, so that's something I just want to say on public record. I, I don't think I... Uh, I yeah, I, that, that's it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Uh, the last thing I'll note then um, is that if there are uh, applicants in the process in, in queue um, that anyone has concern about, we have a public hearing process for every application that comes through. So members of the public are, will, are welcome to come in and say that they have this concern or the other about a project siting at a, a particular location when that comes up. So. Um, I just want to remind folks that there, there is that opportunity to make your voice heard on um, uh, applications as they come up. Uh, related to correcting the um, two errors that we discussed tonight, I think we can close the public hearing and, and get a recommendation from the planning board with some specific language. But it's all part of one order, isn't it? There, the one order has two separate con corrections to make. Manufacturing to 200 foot from schools and locations um, like kindergartens and nursery schools where children congregate regularly. I had that language here just a moment ago. So it's the same as, um, so we need to correct section three location A so that it says any MME shall have a 200 foot buffer from uh, any pre-existing public or private school providing education in pre-K, K, or any grades one through 12. Just like we carve out for the RMRE only at 200 feet instead of 500 feet. That's what we agreed upon and passed last time. Um, the other is- but That is not what passed, obviously. No. <laughs> So, I mean, um, that may have been the intent, but that's not it, what passed. Yeah, I don't think at least that's my understanding. The public <laughs> hearing, it's this and that. If we're open for one part, I think we have to keep the we're, hearing open. No, I'm not asking to keep the, the hearing open. I'm saying we, we're we're closing it on these two issues. If we want to take up the um, odor issue, I'm I'm recommending that we file a separate order and advertise it separately, so that members of the community that would have an interest in it would be able to come out and weigh in. Well, They're not going to be able to weigh in on this the way that we've advertised it. Um, 
Well, speaking for myself, I'm not ready to close this public hearing. We are waiting for some language and research from planning. And so I think we need to keep it open. Language and research on what? The buffer and the permit process, which is what the order is. I make a motion that we continue the public hearing and choose a date certain. Is there a second? I'll second it. The motion has been made and second to uh, continue the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. No. So that's three. But um, Councilor Hernandez, where are you? I have a three to one vote. Well, it's majority, I guess, so it doesn't really matter. So we need to choose a date, sir. Um, Ms. Lopez, you have your hand up. Yes, I have a question. Um, so now I'm very confused as part of the planning board because I thought the last couple of meetings we had when we were joined, the agreement was to change from 500 to 200. Now we're saying that we have to revisit that us the planning board Right? Is that, please correct me, that the planning board has to revisit that and it's up to the planning board to make that decision now? The recommendation. To switch it? Well, is well. That, is that where we're continuing this? I'm just confused and I want a little bit of clarification because I feel as though we went around in circles this whole meeting of something that we already spoke about many a times and now we're back to square one. Right. So, in order to move forward, we need a recommendation from the from the planning board. We can only get a recommendation from the planning board if we close the public hearing. I, I mean, to me, on these issues of reflecting what we had discussed so that there was a 200-foot buffer from schools and kindergartens and uh, public or private K through eight, K through 12 institutions, um, Now we're buffering against businesses? Right. Like, I guess that's what my confusion is. Yes, because my order actually says, um, so the two things that we would be reviewing was the reference to table 4.3 in principal uses. And that, and that was a mistake based on our conversation. And that's why I wrote the order this way, so that we could revert to what we had discussed previously. Um, same thing for striking the site plan review process section um, 71065B that we discussed earlier. So I, I, see I am totally the open to having a discussion about buffers related to odor, but I do think that that is a separate issue that needs to be advertised independently. I see um, two hands up. I want to be respectful of um, Ms. Panich, and then I, I lost the other hand. I'm sorry. Aaron. Aaron. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I just wanted to weigh in briefly on process here. Uh, I think what I understood was going on was that we were being asked to come back and make a recommendation on process and on buffer zones. Um, that would be a conversation that at least we had advice from previous city solicitor that we on planning could discuss matters in simple meetings and not in public hearings when we were attempting to work on things like rewriting um, an ordinance. So we could work on this without having to go to a continued public hearing. But I would have thought, and I have to agree with Councillor Vacon here, if you are looking for a new draft from us, you all on the city council, of course you need to have your hearing open because how are you supposed to discuss evaluation of the language if you can't re um, receive new information? Uh, the alternative, I would think, would be for us to 
you know, write you a recommendation after closing saying that this discussion obviously isn't going anywhere because the issues are more complex than they originally appeared to be and hold it for, you know, therefore this, you know, we recommend against doing anything now and we wait for the next public hearing. I mean, I can see going either way, but, you know, I think that's the process that Ms. Lopez was asking about. Mm -hmm. Yes, but with all due respect, what we, what we, I mean, the process is laid out. So we have a, our joint hearing, then we close the hearings, and we get a recommendation from you. And all we need to do, per my order, is make the two corrections. There's no, there's no new language. It was language that was already discussed. And in your recommendation, we would have that language before us. I don't see, I don't see... If we wanted to pull up the 200-foot buffer um, in relation to agricultural uses, motor vehicle repair, motor vehicle service stations, wireless communication, bus, taxi, or public transit terminals, if we want to get into that discussion, which is what um, Mr. Aubin is proposing, we, yeah, that, that needs a full public hearing. That needs an entire full-on discussion, as I mentioned, because multiple interested parties are going to want to have the ability to weigh in on that. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, agree. Uh, I agree completely. I, ha I have Aaron Vega and Q and then Councillor Bacon. So, I, yeah, so I think, I think I'm going to say the same things, just probably more in layman's terms. Can you, um, and I'm just assuming here, can you close the public hearing and if you wanted to approve the one part of the order where we would get rid of the site plan review and then not recommend changing the buffer and then we start a new order. I mean, can we do, can you do that? And I'm only assuming since that conversation was a while ago, I think we were on the same page with the site plan review. So can't you, can you give a dual recommendation on your order? Yes, to getting rid of that one section, no to changing the buffer and then a brand new order to start the, the conversation. Does that work? Yes, that, that could work. See, I'm the middle way guy, so I want to you know, <laughs> try to get some things moving forward and, and, and have an in-depth conversation about the buffer, which is related to order. Uh, Councillor Vacan and Councillor Anderson Burgos. Thank you. So the buffer, we have gotten into a discussion of odor related to the buffer. However, that is not the only issue related to the buffer. We had debate about the buffer before we even had discussion about the odor. So they should not be conflated with each other. The recommendation by the business owner that's given to us tonight for consideration, which I heard, I thought, um, Mr. Vega say he wanted to look at the implications of that proposal, which I thought we would discuss in a subsequent public hearing, is on point of the order. I believe if we close this public hearing with no other recommendation, with a recommendation to change, for example, the permit process, and without changing the buffer, there will be no use allowed within 200 feet of any marijuana manufacturing because the current ordinance will stand. However, if we want to amend the current ordinance that restricts all activity and uses outside of 200 feet of a manufacturing facility for marijuana, then we need to keep the public hearing open. We need to get the information back in the public hearing. Mm -hmm. If the planning board wants to close their public hearing because they think they have everything they need to know, they can. But we've made the mistake of closing our public hearings prematurely before and I'm not warm to changing my vote. We've already voted on continuing the public hearing. All we need to do is pick a date. All right. So I think, just to be clear, a subsequent public hearing and a separate public hearing are two, two separate things. So, because I see... Uh, We're continuing this public hearing. Yes, but this public hearing has both things in it, and I think what we want to do is be able to wrap up at least... Um, part B. And, it's an and sentence. They're both in the public hearing. Yeah, I, I, I disagree. Uh, I, I'm not changing my vote. We I, already voted. It's a 3 2 vote, and now we're debating the vote. Under discussion, I have Councillor Anderson Burgos and Councillor Hernandez in queue. 
Yes, Councillor uh, Chair Lisi, I want to change change my vote to a yes. We should close the meeting. You, you can't or the public hearing. You can't do that. You could you can motion to reconsider. That's sorry. That's what I meant. And then that has to be seconded. Second. The motion has been made and seconded, but before, under discussion, Councilor Hernandez, you also had your hand up. Yes, no, I just wanted to make sure because my voice wasn't projecting earlier and I'm glad that you counted my vote as that um, in favor of closing the public hearing, but I um, agree with Councilor Anderson Burgos and everything that said with closing the hearing and then taking the separate um, issue with the odor separately to allow other coalitions and other people to weigh in on it. I think that's very important especially with um, what has happened, you know, in Holyoke in the past, like with the coal um, factory and the asthma um, affecting our most vulnerable populations. I think that we really need to take this separately and weigh in on it heavily to make sure that um, we are protecting our communities and the most vulnerable people in it. So there Thank was a, a motion to reconsider our actions um, all in favor on reconsideration? No. Aye. 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 One, two, three. No. It's three to two vote. Um, is there a new motion then? I motion that we refer to legal to see if we can break up the public hearing order into two parts, close one and keep the other open because- No, that's not what is being proposed. That do that. What is being proposed is that we close the public hearing on this order, refile, to have a discussion of 200 foot buffer related to odor and all these individual uses that have been carved out of table 4.3. So closing the door on this order and saying so many good issues were raised in relation to odor that it deserves its own public hearing. That's what was being proposed exactly. and that's why we would like to close this public hearing and move forward on at least correcting the um, site plan review because that is holding up uh, our, our planning board at the moment. Planning department, sorry. Except that we heard from the director of the planning department that he wanted to look at that language and come back to the public hearing with the implications on both of these things. He talked about what would be the effect on the existing businesses and that he wanted to look at that and come back. I mean, I just think you want to close the public hearing and the committee voted and now you've convinced I didn't do two anything. members of the committee to change their vote. I only registered no, a three no, to one vote. No. I registered a three to one vote. Nobody. I, I asked, excuse me, Councillor Anderson Burgos, I have the floor. I asked Councillor Hernandez if she wanted to register a vote. I never heard anything. I turned to you and said, well, it's a three to one vote, so the majority has it. We right. have a majority on, and, and, I, and I, I settled it there. Right. And then other questions came up. And for the last 10 minutes, you've been talking about why we shouldn't close the public hearing after we voted to close it. I think, I think there's confusion. I, mean, I think it. there's confusion <laughs> about what's being proposed. Um, Councilor Anderson Burgos. Okay. Yeah. For the record, I just want to state. No one pushed me to change my vote. I heard what I needed to hear and I based my decision on what was presented in front of me. What? Nobody pushes me to vote anything unless I feel it's right or wrong, okay? So just for the record, so please well, don't throw well, accusations out there. Well, Thank through you. Through the chair and with due respect, I would just be interested to understand what happened in the last 10 minutes to change the yes to continue the public hearing to no. Nothing, I didn't hear any facts that changed in the 10 minutes. I'm just curious. Um, is Mr., sorry, Attorney Bissonette, I saw your hand up. I don't know if you wanted to weigh in. Well, I think the no, there's a question. lot of feedback. We're going to need to mute you. We're gonna I'm need sorry. To mute you. I'm sorry. Too much feedback. You might have to dial in Attorney Bissonette. It, it, it sounded like a vacuum. So... The motion on the floor, I see your hand, um, Count, uh, Ms. Lopez, but um, we're going to probably need to take action on the 
motion that was made and then I would allow the, the, the planning board to have its own um, vote. Um, so the motion was made and seconded to reconsider and that was passed. Was there another motion? I don't have it in my records. I made the motion to request from legal whether we can act on the site plan review process and not deal with the buffer, which is what I'm hearing. And I'll second that. And we can't, and I had a second. We can't get him to dial in. Can you help him identify how to dial in? He's, he's not dialed in yet. But can you send him a chat to show him how to dial in by phone so that he can do that? Um, while we're waiting for Attorney Bissonette to connect by phone, um, Ms. Lopez, I'll recognize your, your hand up. I just wanted to clarify that I think there is a confusion and we're talking about two separate things. So we understood because we were basically talking about 5B and either changing the wording or eliminating that completely. And then when the public spoke, came up the issue of, or, of order and the 200 feet. So I think they're two different things. And what I'm understanding is, let's close out 5B, vote on that, and then move forward so everybody else can have a bigger discussion on the discussion that we're already having. Yes, no? Like, I don't think there's confusion. I just think that we keep talking about the same thing because certain people want to make their point and we're really getting nowhere. It, it is and it's very frustrating. It is very frustrating. Chair Lisi, the, the problem is the right way here. the order is written, it is difficult to understand that it is talking about the buffer. The order says the reference to table 4.3 of principal uses. That is talking about the buffer, which is the and part of this public hearing. Mm -hmm. And we were asked earlier to come back to be able to receive more information from the planning director relative to the second part of the order, which is directly related to the buffers. Right now, our current ordinance says there must be a 200-foot buffer between a manufacturing facility for marijuana and any other use in the city. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't show in the order that that's what it is, but that is what it is. That's why I ask our staff and the planning department to send us the language so that we can see what it is. When we're dealing with references and we can't see the information, that's where we get into this confusion. And it's not a goal of being adversarial, it's a goal of being clear what we are talking about. This is not just a grammatical fix. This is a debate about the buffer. Now, the intent of the chair filing this order could have been to go in and make a simple grammatical change and reference change. However, facts on the ground, information has changed since the time the city council passed this ordinance as written and today. And in fairness, this public hearing should remain open so that we can receive that information. If the planning board wishes to close their public hearing and then give us whatever recommendation, that's fine. But I just feel that this is, n is not good process and the vote the committee took to continue was totally correct. We have two issues before us, site plan review process and if we're gonna clean it up and how, which we're waiting to hear back from our planning director and the buffers. They're both in this same public hearing. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so, ma'am, and I apologize. I thought we were still talking about the, the site plan review, and then we jumped into something else, and we never finished the site plan review. So that was my confusion. I apologize, because I'm still waiting for us to decide for 5B to then move on to the next. So I apologize. Thank you. But I do want to, as the maker of the order, express the point that the reason why this order was filed was because the language that we somehow passed was not reflective of the discussions that we had or the even the draft that I had because the draft that I had had 200 foot buffer from schools in it 
not from the entire table. So the reason why I wrote my order to correct the reference to table 4.3 in section 71053A is because that is the mistake. It is not supposed to say, say table 4.3. So that needs to be corrected to reflect the, the prior discussion. Yes, we have to have a public hearing to do this. And these other issues came up. The other issues are valid. The other issues have merit. But that was not what was advertised. What was advertised was correcting the reference to table 4.3 related to that part that re refers to the buffer. So yes, it triggered a conversation. But again, to the point that I keep on pressing is that I think in the same way that we thought IP should have its own hearing, that the downtown residential um, overlay zone for retail establishments should have its own hearing so that people can see what we're discussing, members of the public, interested parties would be able to then come out and weigh in. And I think that to say, to pick 200 feet from all these different uses or to, to pick out you know, a handful of uses without having any of these other folks that are in these uses come out and, and weigh in, is a, it's not a clear or transparent process. What's clear and transparent is that we made a mistake. Table 4.3 is not supposed to be in the principal uses, and we needed to correct that language. Boom. I mean, the other piece is uh, site plan review process is not what was intended. Um, there was a review process that we wanted, and it seems that we actually have a re review process. So, so another uh, misinterpretation or, or mistake in the, in the language. And, uh, we already had lengthy discussions on this. And, and I do think that what would be prudent here is to make the corrections that were called for and file this issue on the, on the buffers related to odor in a separate item that could be taken up and have, have its full day in court with many, many more members of the public weighing in on it. Chair Lisi. Councilor Vacan. Again, we are hearing from the public. We are hearing from the public tonight that is affected by the buffers listed in Table 4.3. Regardless of how the ordinance got to where it is, it is current law within the city for a 200 foot buffer between every use and the manufacturing, regardless of how we got there and regardless Absolutely. of the intent. Absolutely. And that's so we now we're here that. and we have the public coming to us saying they do not want table 4.3 to go back to what you're saying it should be. They're saying they want it to be something different. And the planning director asked us to give him time to look at both the process language and the impact of changes to the buffer and come back to us, which is why one reason why I voted to continue the public hearing so that he can do that. Once we close our public hearing, we can't take in new information. We're done. We can't take in new information. So if we do that, then we're limiting him to come back to us relative to the process and the buffer. So I just, I just think they're both there and they both have to be addressed and we've been asked to allow them to do that and I just think we should. If they wanna close their public hearing, then they can still come back to us. We have to wait for their recommendation in any event. Sure. So, um, Councilor Hernandez, Yes, we have um, attorney Mike Bissonnet back online. Should we open up the discussion so we can weigh in? Thank you. Uh, attorney Bissonnet, you're, you're dialing in. You're just um, being transferred over into the live session, so um, just another moment. No, he, he should be able to talk right now. Um, star six is how you unmute yourself on the you, phone. You can talk now if you need to unmute yourself from your phone. It's star six. 
So we're not hearing you. You might, you might need to hit star six on your phone. We might be getting something now. So he tried just to unmute the video. Maybe there's no feedback now. Want to unmute your video, Attorney Bisonet? Trying now. Uh -huh. No, we muted you because there is still feedback. Um, and on the phone, you know, I'm, Chair I, Lisa, I I'm going to renew my motion to continue the public hearing to a date certain, I would suggest September 14th. We already have a public hearing happening that night. Um, the motion was made and seconded to, um, continue the public hearing. Uh, we cannot continue it for the 14th because we have a full agenda for that evening. Um, we could do it over the 28th, however. Okay, so Sorry. September 28th. The motion has been made and seconded to continue to the 28th. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll find out um, some more from Attorney Bissonette on this offline. Mr. Kelly, will we be available for um, September 28th? Um, I won't be here. I'll be gone the 28th through the 14th of October. So we may have a, you know, other board. We could have a quorum of the other four board members. I'm not sure, but I guess I'd like to get some direction from our board as far as whether they want to close this public hearing or continue it. It sounds like we have to continue it, but I'm not sure. Like I'm not. Like, I'm not sure what exactly is expected from us at this point. Mm -hmm. so we could continue or we could close and offer a recommendation. We can mm -hmm. do either one. It is entirely up to us. Right. And I'm just looking for I'm just looking for a motion or direction from someone on the board. That's why I would put things on we're... September 28th, just so you all know. Mm -hmm. I think we have discussions amongst ourselves about what to recommend, but I'm uh, inclined to think that we can close and make a recommendation. Well, I'm comfortable going either way, depending on what the rest of the board wants to do. Well, we can, okay, we, we can close, we can continue to a date, in the future, which is not the same date that the orders can be voted on, because again, we look at our own calendar. So, yeah. um, you know, if we close, we close, make a recommendation. We could continue. We're looking at some time, probably toward um, the end of October. Uh, October twelfth, we could do. Hmm? What October? No. Oh. Oh. Um. Yeah, we got a pretty full agenda September 14th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one way around this is that if we move to continue for the uh, yeah. You know, I understand that we're booked up on the 14th, but if we move to continue to the 14th, and by then we have decided that we don't need to keep continuing, that we're ready to close and make a recommendation, we can just close. Okay. And otherwise, we can just open and recontinue. That's an option. You want to make that motion, Mimi? Sure, I'll make that motion. Why not punt? Mm -hmm. so you're, what's, what's the motion you're making? Oh. It moved to continue to September 12th. Or that was 14th. the date. 14th. Thank you. At, at 5.30 p.m.? At 5.30 p.m. Is there a second on that motion? I'll second that. Okay, Kate, second, second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Motion to take up item one. 
Motion has been made and seconded to take up item number one. This is a public hearing um, updating the Holyoke ordinances of uses, defining restaurant, adding to section two under appendix A, restaurant, a business establishment where meals or refreshments may be purchased, restaurant sit down, a building or portion thereof containing tables and or booths. Um, there's full definitions here that I think will be taken up as part of the discussion, so I'll do it abbreviated reading and um, on the motion to take up item number one. So moved. And motion to open the public hearing for item one. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to open the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Okay, motion to open the public hearing the Hoyt Planning Board to take up a zone uh, tax change for section two definitions, defining restaurants. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Um, so under discussion, Councilor Murphy, you're the maker of the order. Um, I do believe that we have the language that's been considered here before us. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, so this was filed uh, after we had uh, someone trying to open up basically uh, an ice cream uh, stand in, uh, in the flats. Yes. Uh, and, and they were denied uh, because they didn't have restaurant status. Uh, I know I met with uh, Mr. Vega and, uh, and I think uh, Mr. Burkott helped put the language together in terms of trying to make it so that it's a clear definition. Uh, I know eventually we were in a position to uh, get a permit for that facility by putting a couple of dining tables inside, even though for the most part people are going in and getting ice cream and taking it out, there were a couple of places to allow them to sit down and, and, and dine. So the definition is trying to make it a little looser in terms of restaurants so that that kind of operation, uh, you know, they're coming in, you can come in and get there and sit down, but you can also just take it out. And, and in this case, the ice cream shop in the flats would be primarily going in, buying the ice cream and having an ice cream cone and leaving more than likely. Uh, but there are there are a couple of tables. So that's that was the attempt to try to make it uh, the original purpose or the original goal was to not have any any sit down locations. Uh, and and Aaron, I'm going to ask you to help me on this because I know you help sure. with the definition. Uh, but we just try to make it so that we can accept as many businesses that want to come in doing things that are productive. Uh, without having so many restrictions. Like I said, I, I think the ultimate restriction was that it was not considered a restaurant because it was going to be all eaten outdoors. Uh, well, and, and, and is that correct, Aaron? Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, you, you're, you've got it. And uh, I want to thank Jeff Burkott uh, and also our building commissioner uh, for helping out with this. Basically, what it is is, you know, and again, you know, thank you to the city council for, you know, when we talk about downtown revitalization and redeveloping places like Open Square and places like the train station, uh, the Arts and Overlay Ind Industry District uh, overlay allows for multi use and allows for restaurants. The issue was that there was no definition of restaurants. There was three definitions of kinds of restaurants. And so when someone tries to set something up in this zone, uh, it's sort of confusing to interpret what restaurant maybe was defined and the intention of the city council. So much like we did uh, on the positive side of our redo of the city council cannabis ordinance recently was the first things we did was put in definitions right through that. Um, and so that's what this does. This first defines restaurant uh, and then gives additional uh, definitions for dine-in, takeout, or fast food. It just gives um, it gives planning and the building commissioner as we try to bring in businesses downtown, not just flexibility, but the ability to sort of look at our ordinances in a little clearer way and allow things like whether it be an ice cream shop, pizza, or a full-scale restaurant into this area. Uh, it's going to give us a little more flexibility and give us a good tool in the toolbox to have these things happen. So it's just adding definition uh, and clarity. Uh, and, you know, as, um, as all, all of you are aware, as you've been on this committee for many years, one time as you dig into ordinances, sometimes we find those inconsistencies uh, and things that don't necessarily relate to more modern things we've done as far as like overlay districts. So this hopefully just puts some clarity in there so we can approve these kind of restaurant businesses that we all want to see in downtown. And Aaron, just to clarify, it's the Smart Growth Zoning Overlay District? 
Sorry. Thank you, Jeff. Smart. Yep. Thank you. Um, Councilor Smart Bacon. District. Uh, so I'm seeing a document that says the current language, but I don't think I have anything that says what we're going to. This is the proposed new language. So the current language is on the bottom and the yep. what's above it is the proposed yep. new language? Yeah. Okay. I just got these things when I got home from work, so I haven't had time to yep. really study them. And everything I understand about it is just to try to establish a clear definition of restaurant and then there are different kinds of restaurants, but uh, the ice cream thing could not be classified because it wasn't considered a restaurant at that point. It they, would be considered a restaurant under these new definitions. And they were having difficulty getting a permit? Correct. Because and of I, that? Yeah, I okay. think we had, we finally got it, I think about, what, three months after that here? <laughs> it was a while, I know that. I mean, and we ended up getting everybody together and we kind of figured out, okay, this is how we can do it. Okay. Uh, and, that's, and then this was so that we don't end up with a new business coming in also having Running that problem. In Thank you. I'm still trying to make sure we protect, obviously, so we don't do something that's yeah. going to be de uh, jeopardizing a neighborhood. Okay. Um, so just because it is a public hearing, and I don't know who's actually out there who might want, want to speak, I just want to clarify that um, what we're looking to do is define three different types of restaurants. One is a general. Uh, definition and then the other two distinguish between a sit-down restaurant and a drive-in or takeout restaurant I, I think we're, we're our first thing is just trying to define a restaurant as, as the first their very first line I think is something that's a little bit different and then the others the restaurant sit down the restaurant drive-in and takeout are somewhat consistent but it's creating that first definition. A restaurant is a business established where meals or refreshments may be purchased. That, that is not part of the older ordinance that I, that I could find. So it's just trying to make that definition uh, and then it defines it in terms of whether it's defined as a restaurant sit down or a restaurant drive in later, <laughs> if that okay. makes sense. Okay, but there's still- If I may through the chair. Councilor Vagan. Thank you. Um, so by calling a restaurant a business establishment where meals or refreshments may be purchased, it would allow the ice cream shop to have two small tables, but they wouldn't have to meet the sit down of all these percentages and stuff. Yes? Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, one question that I have for the planning staff, uh, the current language defines um, three different types of restaurants. Correct. So there's still a uh, there's a definition for restaurant fast food, yep. but obviously that wasn't going to be part of this part of the order as filed because there were no amendments being made to that one. Okay. So okay. that's so that would remain, and the only um, changes would be the other two would be added in front of the fast food definition, or in place. Well, no. So, well, it'd be it'd be these. Right, um, you've got the existing definition for restaurant fast food, and then you've got the the restaurant current definition that you're, we're adding restaurants sit down and then also adding the fact that those sit down restaurants can also provide drive-in takeout service or food delivery like Grubhub or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, a restaurant drive-in takeout can also mm -hmm. adding that similar line of uh, food delivery service or dr can be a, well, obviously it's kind of redundant, but restaurant drive-in takeout may also offer drive-in takeout or food delivery services just mm -hmm. to further clarify that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then we've got the fast food, which is independent. It's, it's more of a fast, griddled, fat, you know, it's, it's, um, but there were no amendments to that. So we didn't uh, add that to the order, obviously. Right. But I think what we want to just be sure of, and I'm sure it'll come out in the recommendation, the, the language for this section two yeah. under Appendix A would then have one defined restaurant, two restaurant sit down would be defined, three restaurant drive in or takeout would be defined, and then the, the actual um, language in the ordinance would have a fourth restaurant fast food Correct. component. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Krokemeyer, did you have your hand up? No. Okay, so any other members of the committee or the planning board? Oh, she does want to speak. I'm 
You're, you're being recognized if you wish to speak, Ms. Krukemeyer. I can't. Yeah, thank you. The way it's helped me to think about this is that in the original, which I'm looking at right now, there were three categories. And what you see in front of you as restaurant sit down was just labeled restaurant. Mm -hmm. So the clarification is that restaurant, as written in the amendment here, creates the umbrella category. Yeah, thank you so much. Right. Mm -hmm. Are there any other members of the committee or the planning board that wish to speak? Seeing none, um, we'll invite members of the public that are here on this item to speak in favor or against the proposed changes. Seeing that there's none, I'll entertain a motion to either continue or close this public hearing. I'll make a motion close to close the public hearing. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The ordinance committee has closed its hearing. I'm registering a four to. Councilor Hernandez, you want to register a vote? Yes, I said aye. Okay, five to zero. And I just want to thank Mr. Vega and Mr. Burkhart for their for their help on this. I'd like to entertain a motion to close the public hearing with the Yahoo Planning Board. So moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, proceeding. A motion to take up item two. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to take up item number two and open the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Um, this is that section 4.6.3.2 be amended to allow for increased fence heights by special permit. And we have some proposed language before us. I'd like to attend a motion on public hearing of the Hart Planning Board. Take up a zone text change for section 4632 in sight by special permit. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank, thank you. Uh, so I'll start the discussion as the maker of the order. Um, I know a lot of counselors has, have been hearing about this, so um, other counselors will be invited to make comment as well. Um, but essentially, the um, special permit, so fence heights in the city are limited to six feet, and then the special permit sorry, four feet, and the special permit allows up to six feet. Um, so there are some new businesses coming to the city that um, need to put up fencing higher than what the special permit um, ex except, exception allows for, that up to six feet. And so um, this would allow um, a maximum of eight feet, it seems, um, Councillor, can I clarify? Yes, thank you, Mr. Burkott. Okay, so for what it's worth, right now, as of right, you can do a four-foot fence in a front yard or a six-foot fence on a side or rear. The current special permits that are available under uh, 4632 allow for up to eight feet in any of the you know, front, side, rear, um, meeting certain requirements under you know, A, for industrial uses, B, commercial uses, C, for multifamily, D, for budding properties, and E, within a front yard, oh, meeting these, uh, the uh, Tri site triangle. So at this point, the maximum that could be allowed could be up to eight feet with a special permit. I see it now. Yep. And is there a recommendation that we, sh we should be considering? Is it to eliminate the um, limit or is there a proposed limit that we should discuss? Is that, is that a, oh, sorry, is that a question for planning staff? Yeah, because so, so for what it's worth, I've gotten you know again it's it's it was I, I was thinking of this more as a, a discussion at this point, and then obviously uh, that would perhaps come up with something. I mean, I know part partially why this is um, is being brought forward was due to the there was a recent development which you know uh, by rights the board planning board could only grant up to eight, but then there were these other guidelines which would be picked up under exemptions four six three three a that was saying you know minimally speaking. Uh, the, these FGI guidelines, which is a facilities um, uh, a facility guideline institute, they were stating that this specific use could, should have a minimum of 10, but their desire was to go to 12. So that's what kind of uh, spurred this. But then also thinking of you know future other business, you know if tomorrow a uh, driving range, a commercial driving range wants to move in, 
by rights, they could only go to eight. Or if you know a, a baseball stadium wished to be built, they could only go to eight. Um, you know, there are some other fences in the city currently. Thinking of like Dean Tech, for instance. Now, whether or not the city is exempt from the the regulation or not remains to be seen. That was built built several uh, you know years ago, but you know that's got to be at least uh, 16 feet, if not greater than 20. I, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are. I'm thinking two panels of eight. Um, so at any rate, uh, I don't have anything specific, but thought it was a talking point. I mean, the, a, 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 you know, I'm not going to say a quick because it makes it, it lessens it. The, you know, you could say that to have it just be remove the eight altogether and have it be just generically by special permit. And then at that point, it becomes a subjective approval based on, you know, um, the obviously looking, looking into the, the bullet points under 4632. Um, those items will be taken into consideration. Um, but I don't have a, a, a succinct, you know, um, number to offer you. I mean, I was looking at some guidelines for uh, driving ranges and they say they range in height from 25 feet to 100 feet. So, you know, I don't, I, I don't have anything specific to offer just that, you know, I guess it's up, it's up for discussion. Uh, thank you, Councilor Vacan. So I'm reading this as you were talking, but I, the way I'm seeing it, you're saying make it a special permit, leave it open so that you can consider the unique aspects of any application that may come in that would need something different. And if we don't set a height limit, you would have discretion, which to me seems like with the variety of projects we're having come in and we're trying to make things work for businesses and people that are trying to meet unique needs, it seems we should make it so that each can be evaluated on its merits. So I would be comfortable with taking out the limitation on the height. I mean, I know we'll be governed by whatever other regs apply, but it seems to me then the planning boards looking at the site plan and knows how it will impact on the others and then will also know the safety aspects and the other things that you've addressed in these other bullets, right? Correct. Which leaves it discretionary. Yes. But if somebody can come in and make their argument clearly and easily enough relative to safety or something of that nature, it has that ability, right? Right, and plus remember it is a public hearing, so the all the abutters within 300 feet would be noticed and it would go out, you know, it's, it's in the paper, so. It's not like it's something that's being done outside of the public eye. Mm -hmm. Well, for myself, I'm comfortable with leaving the flexibility there. I would agree with that. Do you want to, do you want to be recognized? Uh, what is that? Do you want to be formally recognized? No, no. I'm just being informal. <laughs> um, anyone else wish to speak? Seeing none, I would um, invite members of the public who want to weigh in on this um, to speak at this point in time. Um, if you're online, you would need to raise your hand either by going to uh, more, the three dots, or the reactions button on your Zoom screen. Um, otherwise, if you're joining by phone, it's star nine to raise your hand. Uh, our our uh, administrative assistant is saying that there's no one raising their hand at this time. I'll make a motion we close the public hearing. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. So moved. I maintain a motion to close the public hearing of the planning board. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. And then um, item number four is the last item. A in motion to take up item four and open the public hearing. Second. Motion is made and second to open item, um, open the public hearing for item number four. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So Aye. moved. This is a um, order to review and amend section 6.4 of the zoning ordinance so that we are in compliance with the consent judgment and permanent injunction order by the Honorable Mark Mastriani, dated April 12, 2019, and any other updates to streamline the ordinance. 
I need to take a motion to open the public hearing of the Hoyt Planning Board to discuss a zone text change for section 64 signs. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Um, so thank you. We have um, a document here in front of us that looks like it is redlined, although we can't actually see the, um, the red aspect of it, but it is um, strikeouts. Um, and I'm not sure if there are additional suggestions. Oh, I see some underlying text here. So we do have a proposed um, set of changes here that seem fairly comprehensive. Um, I'm not sure, has the planning board had a chance to review these changes? Yes, we have. And do you feel that they're um, comprehensive at this point in time? Or are there other um, items that you want to discuss in particular? Well, I, I guess I defer to other members of the board. They've, they, we've all kind of reviewed it, but go ahead, Mimi, add something. Yeah, this, you know, I think several people have heard me say this before, and I apologize for repeating it. But for anybody who isn't aware of it, part of the problem that we've had with our sign ordinance comes out of a case called Gilbert versus Reed, which was decided by the Supreme Court a few years ago, which basically said you cannot regulate signs according to their content in any way. And it was a confusing enough decision that legal departments across the country have spent inordinate amounts of time and money trying to parse it and review and amend their sign ordinances. So the Supreme Court granted cert in a case called, if I'm remembering correctly, um, Dallas versus National or Reagan National Advertising a couple of months ago. That case is now scheduled for argument in the middle of this coming November. How fully the court decides to revisit Gilbert and Reed, you know, we don't know yet, but they certainly are revisiting some aspects of it. And I was kind of entertained to find that there's an amicus brief supporting the petition for cert from like 4,000 organizations that represent municipal attorneys. And you know, my point in bringing this up is simply that whatever we do now, and I'm not saying we should do nothing now, we should be prepared to revisit it once that decision comes down, which will probably be spring of next year. Because you know, obviously, Reed and Gilbert is just, it's been untenable for legal departments. And you know, we can make this content neutral and we probably should for the time being. But I think that spending too much time attempting to perfect it may be counterproductive because odds are that we're going to have to plunge right back in again in you know eight months or so so i will leave it there with that gloomy news i just have a question um councillor bacon so my question is my understanding is that right now we don't even have a sign ordinance because we put a moratorium on it completely so that we have no ordinance relating to signs whatsoever in the city. Is that an accurate understanding on my part? Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, for what it's worth, I know that I know that past solicitors have stated that um, I do know that, especially when it comes to more of a uh, residential nature, because I'm not quite sure if the ACLU themselves, and again, I don't have the, the, the actual um, response from them, but some into the effect that, you know, there was, it was, it was geared more towards uh, public speak versus uh, commercial. So I can say that the, the sign ordinance has been acknowledged by, by commercial entities and, and new, okay. and new um, business to the city. But I, I do believe that has been an opinion of the past that, the sign ordinance may be, um, how do you say it? Well, a moratorium or on hold, okay. but I do know that it is something that, that is still um, looked at and reviewed when uh, new signage is, is coming, um, especially commercial signage, obviously, 
um, for uh, for review or being installed prior to installation. Okay. So just if I can just make a comment. This is a very frustrating topic because when we took it up the last time, we were told it was out of compliance with the law, so we were trying to make it, I mean, the intent was to get it in compliance and then it was still out of compliance. So do we feel from our legal department that this is in compliance in the moment? Well, I'm not sure if there's anyone from the legal department here to answer that tonight. But I mean, at this point, the draft that I'm assuming you have in front of you, which I just, uh, you know, this is something that the former city solicitor, the building commissioner and planning staff looked at two or three years ago uh, mm -hmm. when, the, when that uh, ruling had come down and then it kind of was shelved and then to recently come back out again. So, you know, I know that the, the copy I'm looking at actually still has some of the, the open-ended comments on the side because there's still, it still needs to be further uh, vetted or addressed. Okay. Okay, so would it be fair to say since, I don't know about the rest of the committee, but I'm just reading this again after a long break for the first time, would it be fair that we would continue this and come back once we can look at it more fully and hopefully button it up then? I don't know. Yep. Uh, Ms. Krukemeyer and then Mr. Vega. Um, I think uh, acknowledging Ms. Panich's opinion that we may have to revisit this again um, relatively soon, but I do think that it's important for us to have a sign ordinance and to have a sign ordinance that passes legal muster. Mm -hmm. And I think that that should happen as quickly as possible and that it might happen in a way that is in some ways provisional, recognizing that we would need mm -hmm. to revisit it. But it seems to me that this m could be um, if possible, a uh, opportunity for a smaller group, a subcommittee, uh, the relevant people, legal, to just come up with a quick fix for this rather than all of us taking time to review it and debate it. I, I mean, I think that there's probably a simple solution that a small group of people could come up with, finalize the questions that still remain in this draft and just get it to us and we can pass it. I'm fine with that. Councilor Vega, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Vega. So, all good. Honored to have been with you many years ago. Um, I was just actually going to echo uh, Ms. Kruckermeyer's comments. Um, with the draft before you, and again, it is, it is you know, in depth, so I think it does take some coming through. So a, a subcommittee, if that's something we could put together with uh, uh, a member of the ordinance, a member of planning, a member of legal, um, I think that would make a lot of sense and, um, you know, run it by a couple other departments as well. Obviously, the building commission would be the enforcer of this, so making sure that they would weigh in. I believe you're also going to have other special permit requests, perhaps in front of you over the next couple of weeks that deal with signage. So I think that there's a, there's a need to address mm -hmm. this immediate and to have a sort of working group that can look at things that happen legally to change this. So I would just, uh, I think I support the idea of a subcommittee if that's something the committee is open to. Um, yeah, I think a working group it sounds like the right way to go here. Do um, we need a motion? Or can we just do it? I think we can just... Um, uh, what is that? Well, well uh, no, I don't think we want to close the hearing. I think we're going to continue the hearing and leave it open and in the process have a, have a working group form, do sort of like the hard look at the um, uh, ordinance and then come back to us with a proposed set of changes. I see your hand, Ms. Panich. In, in the public hearing, right? Yeah. 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 I think that's... No, I just wanted to say that I agree with this. And my comments were more toward the end of we should fast track what we've got and not worry about making it perfect mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And I think a small working group that is going to fast track it and get this done is a great idea. Great. Um, I don't think we need to use their time at this meeting to designate who those folks would be, but certainly one member from uh, ordinance, uh, one member from, from planning, and then we could figure out. And legal. Yes, legal. <laughs> Definitely legal, right? Um, given that it is a public hearing, we should invite members of the public to speak and weigh in. Is there anyone online? That's right. Um, if there's somebody online who wants to weigh in on this item, you can go.
go to um, more, the three dots, or look for reactions and raise your hand that way. If you're phoning in, you would use star nine. So it doesn't seem that any members of the public are here to um, weigh in. So motion to continue would be in order. Okay. So which date do you want? Motion to continue. I think November, December, November, yeah, it November. Pressing, so it's not pressing, right? No, I don't think. Does a continuing to a November date sound appropriate? Early November, perhaps, if there's a working group or Planning um, chair. Stay with them on this one. Do you have a sense of um, what your calendar looks like through um, October, November? Well, I mean, at this point, I can safely say that we have no nothing scheduled on the November agenda, uh, November agendas, and that um, in October. Twenty-six is open. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. I... The twenty-six is open. Okay, twenty-six is open. Maybe that if they want to get one on the books. Does that, does that work for you or do you want more time? Well, I guess if me at this point, during other business tonight, the planning board can discuss who its representative will be, but how soon will we know who the, the city council's uh, representative will be? W within a week, for sure. Okay, because I mean, I, at this point, I just wanted to kind of figure out how soon we should be starting to schedule those subcommittee meetings. Mm -hmm. So um, if you can get me that information, you know, obviously as soon as available, that would be great. And then we'll just anticipate starting to meet, you know, say two weeks from now. Um, so, I mean, I get, at this point, I would say that, um, that, you know, that October 26th could work. It would give us sufficient time. Okay. I'll make yeah, a motion to continue the public. Or, or would not, so, uh, that would be October, yeah, October 26th, sorry. So October 26th at 6.30. Motion has been made and seconded to continue this public hearing to October 26th at 6.30 p.m. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? So moved. I entertain a motion to continue the public hearing on the planning board to October 26th at 6.30 p.m. So moved. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Aye. So I think that concludes the agenda for the joint public hearings. Uh, the ordinance committee has one more item to take up this evening. Okay, and uh, Chair Millie, if you just, just don't mind, I just want to remind the members of the um, planning board that we are in recess. So those who are on Zoom would have to go back in to the meeting. Uh, we started at uh, 5 p.m. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you shortly. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Um, our last item on the agenda is item number six, five by Lebron Martinez. Is there a motion to take this up for discussion? Motion, motion to take, take this up, up for discussion. discussion. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. This is uh, that the city council through the appropriate committee consider a drop and pick up for two parking spots for the van that will pick up and drop off participants that attend vCare adult um, care at 200 to 210 High Street. Um, our last conversation was uh, revolving around whether or not there was a precedent for um, other pickup and drop off spots around the city. And I believe that um, there, there are a number. Did you get to visit any of them, uh, Council uh, Murphy? I, I, know that's I, I did drive around. I only saw one or two, but I also I want to say I, I, I've been watching what's going on in terms of the people getting off and I actually as I keep watching it I I still think they'd be better off with, if they went to the parking lot because it's all level as I see it uh, two things while they when they do and they are getting to park there because sometimes there's not cars there so let me let me make that but when I see them there I see more difficulty climbing up the curb uh, for some of the people and I've seen them the other way and in most cases they if if they are needing assistance it's usually with a walker mm -hmm. uh, and because there's no curb when they're on at the parking lot they 
they don't seem to have the same issue. So that's that's one thing. And then it's also uh, just as, as they're doing it, and maybe it's just because there's not a specific spot, so I don't know that. Uh, but uh, in order for them to get people coming who are not in a wheelchair, if you will, to get them down, they need to be far enough away <laughs> so that they then have a little space before they get to the curb, which then leaves them out there a little far. I still think it, I, I, this might be something to have the city engineer take a look at in terms of whether or not, which way would be better. I mean, I've looked at it and it, there are times I think, oh, that makes sense. But then at other times I, I think, you know, the, the parking lot, because of the fact it, it is, you know, they're walking an extra 70 feet, but it's all level. And, and the only, the, huh? 70. About 70. Yeah. Especially in the ice. It, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, but there, there are spots where I think they could put it right there. It'd be the closest thing right to the building and it would be all level. So that, that part makes me think that is a better spot for them. Uh, and or we got to do curb cuts. But I also thought I remembered from the previous discussion that some of the issues that they're having is they like moving in and out of the front door better because of the way that their space is set up interiorly. Like as if they went in through the back door, they'd have to climb some stairs or something inside. No, no, they, if they parked in a park, they still would be coming in the, in the same door they come in when they do get to park here. I mean, every, everybody I've ever seen, and I can see them from the office, uh, and I've been, I've stood there a few times on the street just to watch, but uh, they're all they're all coming into that uh, what used to, way back used to be you don't remember this but it used to be the Grant store uh, the main entrance to the Grant store and and the like I said the only thing to me where they are if they were to take that is it's the curb which makes it difficult uh, as opposed to walking a little farther but having it all level it, and I, I'm not a medical expert but I think. I am, I am a fall expert, unfortunately, and I've had too many people that I've known that have gotten into falls. Uh, and that's, that's my biggest concern, that they would actually trip and, uh, and fall there where they potentially would be on a level surface walking farther. Now, could they fall walking farther? Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, and there may be, the other thing I looked at, and again, I said the engineer maybe, we, we've got a, le a right turn lane here. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, as I look at it, and then trying to make that, as they do take the right turn and then turn, they're pretty close to those cars that are there, or if the van's there, they're very close to the van as they take that right turn. So, I mean, this might be something where the city engineer can give us engineering advice that might also be good for making it as safe as possible for the people coming. So I do, I do want to note that the ch the engineer did um, provide legal language and measurements for us for one mm -hmm. spot. Um, before I read them into the record, I want to recognize Councilor Vacant. Yeah, the only feedback I got on this matter, and I haven't had, I haven't observed it as um, Mayor Murphy has, is that it's taking away parking, which is again at a premium down there, and it was noted that there is the parking lot. The only other comment I would offer is that if the parking lot goes with the building, they have to keep it sanded, safe, and salted. We all know what happens in the winter with the cars parked with the curbs. Mm -hmm. It becomes very dangerous to have to walk in the street at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm with Councillor Murphy, <laughs> Councillor Mayor, you have so many titles now. Um, from the safety perspective, um, always trying to keep an elder with an appliance and equipment on level ground is a first desire if you can do it. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the engineer has provided measurements um, for an amendment to the traffic ordinance that would essentially create a no parking um, for one space um, it says no parking except to load or unload Monday through Friday between 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. There's a typo here. Oh. And 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. 
and that was the um, one hour window in the morning and the afternoon that vCare had requested. So it's basically making a loading zone in essence. Mm -hmm. One hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, 8.30 to 9.30 and 2.30 to 3.30. And this is um, at High Street, Easterly, a point 20 feet northerly of Dwight and up to a feet, 22 feet further norther northerly. But it's in front of the door, right? Because. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yep, 22 feet. The I only other question I have there is, so with that, he, we are still leaving the parking meter there so there would just be no use of the parking meter <laughs> during those hours. Two hours but, of the day. But the parking meter would still be, so that may be a good compromise. Totally. I still, would, I still would encourage us to talk to the engineer about whether or not we need to get a curb cut. Because I, I just, from what I've seen, I mean. But that, that, would, that would be something that the applicant would need to right. request. And, and pay for. Right, we're not going to do but, that. Yeah, but that that may be fine, but I just think I, I, if I don't want to encourage somebody to go there and know that, you know, those that are more vulnerable walking up that curb have a, you know, that, that's, I mean, I'm just looking at it. I, I, again, I've seen, I've seen it happen too many times. And, uh, uh, and if, and if it means they pay for it, I'm fine with that. But I just, I would like to see if that is something that should be done. Maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe I'm just watching and thinking like, oh my God, what's going to happen here? Uh, and, and I'm just an old man thinking like an old man. <laughs> uh, Councilor Hernandez has her hand up. Yes, I just wanted clarification. So this is the well-attended um, center that has um, lots of activities for our seniors, right? Which is right beneath where the social security office is located okay. on high street. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, and as I recollect, isn't the parking in the back not as, I mean, how many parking spaces are in the back of that building? It's not that many. Cause I remember parking back there and there's usually, I mean, it's not, I have to say that there's not more than a dozen parking spaces back there. And is it being shared with the Social Security office, the parking spaces in the back? Um, maybe, that's, maybe that's why they don't really park in the back and it's easier for them to just like do a quick drop off in the front, which is a shorter distance for people to get to the place itself it's too bad and of course not everybody's gonna have a walker so and so, for some people the distance is more important than you know having probably just stepping over so i think that i would i would um lean in favor of having at least that one space that's for like drop off and pick up at certain um, hours of the day, I, w I, w I would be in favor of that. I I've seen the the activity there, and it's very well attended. And I think that only participation is going to increase as we move forward. So it merits to have um, at least a drop off, pick up, designated spot there. I'm in favor of that. Great. Right. Ask a question through you to the maker. Or, yeah. I mean, not the maker to Terry. <laughs> um, do people go there in wheelchairs too, off coming off the van? I'm just curious. I, I have not seen anybody in a wheelchair. So Most of the people I have are, okay. are well, able to curious. are able, but you know, they're, they're I get, for lack of a better way, they're not all uh, comfortably walking. <laughs> right. They have. I don't know how to say that. Walking. Yeah, Mobility I mean they're, they're, but they are walking. Yeah, not yeah, in yeah. For I, I have, I, I mean, curious. I have not seen anybody in a wheelchair. Oh. I, I haven't seen them in. Now that doesn't mean they haven't. I just haven't seen it. Okay. Uh, everybody I've seen has come off walking, and or I've seen them coming out of the building walking. 
uh, and in many cases with a cane or a walker. Okay, all right. Well, it doesn't eliminate the parking. No, and I think that's a good compromise. Hmm. All right, I'll make a motion to approve. Motion is made um, to motion is made and seconded to approve the um, measurements for a no parking except to load or unload Monday through Friday between 8:30 and 9:30 a.m. and 2:30 to 3:30 p.m. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? So that's five to zero. Because it's a metered parking anyway, right? So nobody's supposed to be there all day. Good. All right. That so concludes our agenda. A motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, so there was a space off here and I